somebody uh, oh. here. Did I make it official? Did the planning board steal your it did. gavel and moved it down? Now we are at uh, our Freeport Town Council meeting number 18-22 here in Town Council Chambers at Town Hall on Tuesday, October 4th. So we'll start with a roll call with a limited audience tonight. We've got Councilor Pillsbury, Present. Councilor Fournier, here. Councilor Egan, here. and Chair Pilch is here. So we've got our quorum. We'll get going and we do expect uh, some other councilors to join either in person or remotely tonight. So with that, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. We have some minutes to approve. Uh, I'll move to waive the reading of the minutes of meeting number 17-22. Second. Uh, held on September 20th. To accept the minutes as printed. Seconded by Councilor Egan. Any questions about the minutes? I see none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's uh, actually, wait, we've got Jake back. So Jake, can you hear us all right? Yes, I abstain. Abstain. Okay. So four to zero with an abstention from Councilor Daniele who was absent. And thank you, uh, Ms. Wolf, for the diligent minutes, as always. And we've got some announcements. I've got three. Uh, the first one is that our Freeport Fire and Police Departments are hosting an open house on October 12th from 5 to 7 p.m. They'll have various equipment and demonstrations uh, used by our public safety and public works personnel ongoing throughout the evening. A variety of community groups will be on hand promoting fire safety. Some of the participants will be Cumberland County Emergency Management, Central Maine Power, Learn Hands Only CPR, uh, Have Your Blood Pressure Checked, See the Police Canine in Action, and many more displays. And there's a, a drawing for door prizes. Uh, and you can bring a non-perishable food item for the FCS Food Pantry to enter a separate drawing. So a lot going on. Uh, look forward to seeing you Wednesday night, October 12th. Uh, next, the town is always accepting applications for people that want to be on town boards and committees to fill vacancies that come up. If you're interested, fill out a board and committee application and return it to the clerk's office. And lastly, uh, we have a Habitat for Humanity project going on in Freeport, at the north end of town. This Saturday, October 8th, they have a construction volunteer day for individuals 16 and older. Uh, they do this about once a month, so if you can't make it this Saturday, keep in touch. You can sign up at habitatportlandme.org uh, to be notified of future ones. Uh, if you do want to come this Saturday, uh, get in touch with Kate Widener. Uh, her email is kate at habitatme.org. That's all the announcements I've got. Does any other counselor have any other announcements to make? So now I'm move on to information exchange, and I'm guessing that we do have some information to exchange. Anybody would like to start? Councilor Egan. And I got a, <clears throat> a couple of things. One is um, I got some feedback from a bicyclist and as well as a couple of motorists about the intersection of uh, Pleasant Hill Road and Flying Point Road, um, where there is a yield sign and not a stop sign. And uh, in particular, the bicyclist um, was advising me of this about 20 minutes after he almost got ran over by a car who didn't see him coming out, coming down Flying Point Road and um, <clears throat> just cruised right through the yield sign and actually passed him on the right. So if you are biking along Flying Point Road and coming into town and a car <clears throat> comes out of that intersection and passes you on the right, that means they're between you and the side of the road which can be kind of hairy if you're on a bicycle. So uh, I'd like to just point out that I've been curious about this for a while and thank you to the resident who pointed it out to me and a couple of others. Um, can we get some data from uh, either PD or Public Works on accident rates there and examine why we have a yield sign instead of a stop sign on a pretty high volume intersection? Yeah, I actually think that 
was referred recently to the Traffic and Parking Committee. I don't think that they've examined and ruled on it yet, but I think that's in their queue right now, okay. Mr. Vice Chair. Great. So <clears throat> not from that. what it sounds like from the cyclist you talked to. I think it was before that because I had gotten a couple comments, and I think Adam might have gotten those comments too. Okay, so. great. Um, and then secondly, um, after the uh, successful housing workshop that we had um, back in September, and certainly from the uh, large volume of email that I've received, and I believe all, all of you have received as well, on the issue and support, uh, it seems like there is a, um, a, a building momentum for the council to address the issue uh, directly. And so I would like to just uh, circulate the idea this evening, I don't have anything prepared uh, to share, but to circulate the idea that at uh, next meeting, we try and put together an ad hoc 12 or 15 month housing committee to take a look at data um, and to look at some um, uh, easy to find uh, challenges that may be in our, our zoning ordinance. I know we're looking at those all the time, but there may be some items that um, the planning department or the codes officer can already identify. And we've had a um, wonderfully generous offer from Freeport Housing Trust to provide um, you know, four to six, seven hours a month of staff time to put into that committee to help gather data and report back to the council. So that's an outline. Um, I'm just trying to get some enthusiasm for it after we heard all kinds of information at that uh, public workshop that we had. And there seems to be uh, quite a bit of interest from the community in, in having that information come together into some kind of a presentation and or report. That's for you. <coughs> I, I agree 100% that we need to move forward on housing. Um, and don't take the, my opinion here as a negative on moving forward, but we have a lot of committees in this town. Do we, have we got the infrastructure currently that we could assign that task to an existing and, and maybe expand the numbers in it or something as opposed to uh, creating a whole new committee? Uh, that, that's one question I would have. Sure, I, if I can respond, I, I suggested that merely because I didn't want it to end up on staff's plate because I think mm -hmm. they're already pretty taxed in terms of trying to spend time with citizen input and particularly from on, on an issue as complex as this. But if we uh, think that there is a committee that uh, would want to take this on and has the capacity to do so, I think that'd be perfectly fine. Yeah. Great, I don't, I don't have anything else, thanks. Yeah. No, I, I, I support the idea whether it's a new or existing committee. One of the things I'm looking to get out of it is to have folks that are more knowledgeable about it than I am because there's more questions I have than answers about, you know, can we try this, should we try that, has somebody else tried it, uh, what, what's likely to work and not work. Um, so whatever mechanism we need to do to get those types of people together in a room talking about it often enough to make some progress and not just you know, a group that's going to meet every so often and, and you know, end uh, after 18 months with just a, a, a high-level recommendation. I'm hoping it'll be more actionable, saying here's something we can do now, here's something we can do later. Um, so that's the structure I, I'd look to put together. Um, and uh, uh, what I'd suggest is maybe sometime before our next meeting we can come back with a more concrete proposal saying here's, here's one way to get it done. If you guys are all okay with that. Daryl, do you have a suggestion on a committee that might want to take on? Well, I don't, but um, I, I, I know I think uh, I, I like your idea using uh, the Freeport Housing Trust. They've got a lot of experience yeah. and a lot of knowledge, and, and that, uh, you know, they got a lot on the plate, but maybe that's the, I would lean maybe towards them just because of that and then add to more people uh, to bring in a, a greater group of experts that could assist them in that task. But they seem to... They got a good handle on the community, and yeah, they and, do. Uh, they do. So that's kind of what I was looking and maybe leaning towards. Okay, so we'll come back next next meeting with some some yeah. ideas. I, I, I know them well enough. I can talk about that some more with them. Okay. Any other information exchange? Uh, so we also now. Oh. Have, oh, yep. Just to congratulate. Um, the fantastic uh, event last Sunday called uh, Electrify Freeport. Mm -hmm. 
which was an expo of electric vehicles and battery operated home uh, maintenance equipment, um, heat pumps, all kinds of information from various groups that are um, well informed about rebates and how to get into various programs for incentives to electrify your home and move off of fossil fuel, as well as just uh, the great example of um, the community coming together with 25 or 26 electric car vehicle owners that um, happily came down and shared uh, many hours on their Sunday to allow people to test drive and find out about their vehicles from old ones like mine to brand new ones that just, just came out. So um, that was great to see and I just want to congratulate um, uh, Freeport Climate Action Now for organizing such a wonderfully smooth running event um, in their first year of existence. Mm -hmm. Yep, I second that. I, w I was there and it was a great event. I brought my little electric scooter for people to try out too. It was fun. Um, and they had mowers and leaf blowers and, and everything, including a, a commercial electric mower business. So yeah. they come to mow your, great. Your, your lawn with a, an electric mower, even a, a big ride on one. Uh, and then also um, just this past weekend was a Freeport Fall Festival. Uh, and I was there on Saturday working one of the tables, and it was packed in a good way. Uh, tons of people out. It was a beautiful day. And I just came tonight from speaking with a few business owners who said it was the either the busiest or second busiest day of the year for them because of all the traffic that the festival had brought in. So kudos to Visit Freeport for organizing that and for all of the merchants in town who put up with the additional traffic and welcomed the additional traffic, I hope. Um, so that was, that was a great event. That's all I've got. We do have two counselors who have joined us remotely. We've got Counselor Bradley and Counselor Daniele who are with us on Zoom. Uh, do you guys have anything to add for information exchange before we move on? I'd have to okay. Mr. Yeah. Counselor Bradley. <coughs> I, was there discussion before I got on of the events in District 2 involving uh, Teo Ferrara? Nope then <clears throat> I'd just like to say that as a resident, not as a counselor, someone whose home was in the center of the search, that um, our police chief, our policemen, the Armist police, the search and rescue, even the FBI, searched relentlessly our neighborhood day and night until the unfortunate event ended. And while um, there's no way to express the kinds of feelings we all have in the community as a result of, of Theo's disappearance and death, um, we should take amazing pride in the commitment that the search and rescue made, despite what was uh, not only discouraging, but a desponding kind of day after day, look uh, through the woods, along the shore, in the waters, in the air. I mean, it, it, uh, and as a, as a, I only say this because I saw it, um, and talk to the people about their feelings, and they're human, um, and despite their despondency, despite their discouragement, they maintained uh, an upbeat, positive, and thorough effort to, to try to save and find Thea. So congratulations to our police force, Nate Gooden, and the rest of them, and all of the others who participated in this. For maybe the first time in my life, I understood what it meant to be protected by the police. So I just wanted to say that. Well said. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Councilor Fournier. To add on to uh, Ed's comment was um, uh, I had a, a, well, a warden and, and some local police come to uh, our area to search, and, and all of them said there was not one resident that gave them a problem. They said uh, it was refreshing to be able to go on anyone's property, do what they needed to do, check the outbuildings, check uh, hunting stands, whatever, and no one gave them a hard time. So I think that speaks to uh, Freeport's residents that when we, when we have to come together and, and do what needs to get done, we do it, so. Yeah, and, and to build on that, the, um, the community had an outpouring of what can we do, uh, and they cr 
cooked hot meals uh, that we brought over to the, the kind of search team every night, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, and they were touched. I think one of them made the comment that they're used to being in the back of a pickup truck under a tarp, you know, for wolfing down some, some jerky. So this was a um, not only a treat, but a, sort of a, a touching reminder for them of, you know, the fact that there are real people in the community that they're serving. Um, so uh, I thank the, the community and, and everyone who kind of gathered together to, to make that happen. That uh, was a nice display. Uh, with that, segue into the town manager's report. Um, I've I wrote some notes. I was going to make very similar comments. So um, please pardon me if I'm being repetitive. I know that uh, the town staff was deeply affected by it, um, and everyone on staff that I've talked to about uh, about the entire scenario, our hearts are really with the family and the school community. It seems like everybody, either directly or indirectly, has a family member that. Uh, has someone in the school who's affected by this. I know some of them are up here on the bench with us and um, on, on TV. So, um, you know, thoughts have been with the the entire community on that, those of us that aren't directly related to those involved. I, I did want to acknowledge the Freeport PD, the massive effort that, that they did, but they weren't the only ones. You know, our chief was leading uh, the, the operation, did a fantastic job, the lieutenant did. Um, I think Nate summed it up best. They were all very disappointed, sad, and dejected by the outcome. They wanted it to be different, but they gave it all that they had. All of our people did. Um, but the real bulk of what we received for outside support from agencies was just incredible. Um, and just a massive amount of resources statewide that were, that were put towards this effort. Um, Brunswick Police Department, um, the search area was across Brunswick and Freeport town lines. Their command staff and their officers were on scene with our command staff every single day. Their chief, uh, Commander Rinaldi, as well, were both here uh, for, I think, almost every day of the search or, um, or were involved from Brunswick. They had several officers at a time here helping us. Um, the warden service put probably a dozen people every day um, into this effort if not more on some days. Um, they had people on the woods, they had K-9 teams, they had people in, you know, um, the Marine Patrol uh, assisted, Forest Service assisted, the volunteer search and rescue teams that assisted from around the state that brought people from all over the state, trained teams and dog teams. Um, state police major crimes, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office were all consulted and were involved throughout the search. Um, and the community support, um, I think, a huge thank you to L.L. Bean, who donated the use of the Outdoor Discovery Center for a command center for over 100 people a day to be in and out of. Um, Dan mentioned the community support, people putting up flyers. Um, Dan's being modest. Uh, Melanie Sachs in our chair actually helped organize the food drive um, and the people that went in. They gathered it all and they brought it down um, several times a day for that. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Melanie, if, um, when she sees this, hopefully. Um, and just, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but the amount of community support that was received, the people who cooked food, I think, I think you mentioned it, the, some of the wardens said, you know, we were afraid we were eating cold food for five days in a row. This, you know, that was one day in a row or two days in a row. And they, that morale that helped them be out there, you know, 16, 18 hours a day with the dogs tromping through the woods really was from the community members. People who've never been to Freeport before, warden services, said that they felt the support from the community. And the caterers who did the lunch, too. Right. So um, so thank you to everybody that helped. Um, I, I don't think I need to dwell on it any more than just everybody recognized the massive amount of resources that the community members put into this effort. So thank you to everybody and to our neighboring agencies who helped out. And I guess I'll segue off of that. Um, uh, one slightly brighter note, um, we received news uh, this week that our finance department uh, received the FY23 Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for eight or nine years in a row now. Again. Mm -hmm. yeah, again. Um, so congrats to Jessica, um, all of our department heads that contribute to that. So I'm kind of on the contributing level with the department heads. Jessica is the one who does the 
several hundred page document that's available on our website to download. One person in the audience um, knows who that is. I think it knows knows what that is. The GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award, but. Um, most people don't understand the amount of work that goes into putting it all together for a presentable document. So um, nice job to her. We are always glad to have her on staff and appreciate the efforts of her and her department to do that document every year and do our whole budget process. So um, that's all I've got right now, Mr. Chair. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, next up is our public comment period. Uh, we have 30 minutes allotted for public comment tonight. Uh, I'm happy to go over if there's demand for it, but if anyone in the public in the room or on Zoom wants to get up and speak about an item uh, that's not the public hearing on our agenda, um, feel free. This is the time to do it. Get up and say who you are, where you're from, and what you want to talk about. Uh, if you want to talk about something uh, that's in other business, uh, such as new building codes or Freeport Community Services or mountain bike trails, um, then hold off because we'll let you talk at the end. But anything else is fair game. We might not use our whole 30 minute budget <laughs> for public comment tonight, it would seem. So going once, going twice, if there's no public comment and nobody on Zoom is raising their hand, then uh, actually it looks like all the folks on Zoom are here for other stuff. So we'll move on to our seventh order of business, which is to take action on the following items of business. We have four of them tonight. The first one is uh, to take action on our consent agenda, which tonight includes uh, an appointment of a warden for an election, uh, and a reappointment to our police advisory committee, uh, some hours for the election, and a couple of donations to the Freeport Community Library. Uh, one of which is notable from the Maine Community Foundation. They donated $2,000 to our Freeport Community Library. So does anyone have any reason why we should deal with any of these items individually and not as a group on our consent agenda? Seeing none, um, we can move the consent agenda as a whole. Uh, Councillor Pillsbury, would you read that, be it ordered? Uh, be it ordered that the October 4th, 2022 consent agenda be adopted. Second. Thank you, Councilor Fournier. Uh, we have to do roll call votes since we have some remote participants, so I'll go down the line. Councilor Pillsbury? Aye. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Daniele? Yes. Councilor Bradley? Yes. Councilor Egan? Yes. And the chair votes yes, so that's six to zero. That passes. Uh, next up, we have item 187-22 uh, regarding proposed amendments to our general assistance ordinance. Uh, we have a public hearing on this, uh, so we'll do the public hearing, um, and then we'll vote. Do you want to give us a brief overview of what this one's about? This is basic. Um, I'll put my microphone on first. Um, this is basic. There's a memo in the packet describing some of the um, changes. Uh, the the biggest change we have to do every year is to change the uh, state set rates. We do this to stay in the eligible pool for reimbursement of general assistance from the state. Um, used to be 50-50, and now it's 70-30, so 70% of our general assistance expenditures, although we expend those locally, we are reimbursed by the state, assuming that we use the state's criteria. So the question always asks, what if, is always asked, what if we don't want to use the state's criteria? The council is free to do that if they want. However, we will receive usually zero reimbursement from the state of Maine, um, which is sizable. So we always recommend that we use these limits. Um, if there was a burning reason not to, we could possibly do some more research, but there would be a significant financial impact to not making this decision. These are the, the uh, allowable maximums um, on they're done regionally throughout the state and they change from year to year so indirectly I would say tied to cost of living yep. any questions for the manager before we open our public hearing council Fournier, do you want to open the public hearing certainly uh, to open the public hearing there's a second. second to the motion. Thank you, Councilor Pillsbury. Uh, we got a vote on this. Councilor Pillsbury. Aye. Councilor Fournier. Aye. Councilor Daniele. 
Yes. Councilor Bradley? Yes. Councilor Egan? Yes. Chair votes yes. So we are now in our public hearing. So if anybody wants to comment on the changes to our general assistance ordinance, now is the time. If you're here, you can step up to the podium. If you're on Zoom, you can raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, Councilor Fournier, would you move to close the public hearing? Uh, motion to close public hearing. Second. Thank you, Councilor Pillsbury. And we got a vote on this. Councilor Pillsbury? Aye. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Daniele? Yes. Councilor Bradley? Yes. Councilor Egan? Yes. The chair votes yes. So that's our public hearing is now closed on a 6-0 to zero vote. And Councilor Fournier, back to you for the be it ordered, if you will. Be it ordered that uh, the amendments to Chapter 46, General Assistance Ordinance and Appendix A-8 for a period of October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2023 be approved. Second. Thank you, Councilor Pillsbury. Uh, any other questions, comments? Councilor Fournier? One question, uh, Peter, uh, and we get reimbursed from the state. Are they good at reimbursing? Yes. Thank you. Yep, this isn't something there's usually um, bills. We get audited as well, so it's a pretty comprehensive program. Um, they come once a year, once every two years. They look through. I, I'm not sure if they've done that yet since we've moved to FCS, but they used to come once a year here, um, look at Joanna's records. They'd actually check to make sure that correct procedure was followed because they're not going to reimburse a town or a city that um you know it's just handing out money without doing the qualification procedure so it's it's established it's they do a good job of it one of the things that the state gets right right now i think Councilor bradley a couple of questions um since we've done this last we've delegated the responsibility for general assistance to freeport community services am i right that's correct and i guess my question is since reimbursement um <clears throat> is such a important issue to what extent do we coordinate with freeport community services to make sure they're following the same guidelines we would expect ourselves to follow had we maintained that responsibility uh yep i know that personally i can say i've talked at least five or six times since then with mike uh Tausik. we've we actually have sarah from fcs council bradley in the room you don't need to speak unless no I, I, she's not here for that but um <laughs> But that's Mike's supervisor. Um, but I do know that I'm communicating with him regularly. We're actually very encouraged. I know that, I think, Dan, you might have been in on one mm -hmm. of those conversations. The town hall staff, um, the finance department interacts with them weekly um, to okay. clear expenditures. Um, the I'm very comfortable that he applies the very similar uh, level of stringency that Joanna did when she was here. I don't think there's anybody that's not getting assistance that, that needs it, but Mike does make people go through the um, the qualification stage, and I don't think he's, I, I think there's about 0% chance that our money, um, the town portion of that or the state portion is being wastefully spent over at FCS. He's very thorough. So um, I do know that people are getting help, and he's doing a good job of qualifying them. So just from my observation, I know the finance department is pretty comfortable with what they're seeing for invoices. Uh, I, I would definitely hear it if they're if they started seeing something uh, out of the ordinary between the transition, but they they don't. So, okay. Or, or secondary question is it? I don't really understand <clears throat> how you get out of sync. But is it possible that AFCS or the town council could um, apply a either stricter or a more generous standard for one thing? and continue to get reimbursed for all the rest of it? Or if you get out on one thing, are you out on all things? That's a great question. I don't have a good answer for that off the top of my head. Do you want to take a stab at it? I know you've done, Sarah's going to try to answer that question, Ed. She's done GA in her previous position before coming to FCS. So she's got more experience in the field than I do with the city of Westbrook. So go ahead, Sarah. All of my audits were glowing. Oh, so <laughs> there's a lot of oversight of what's happening and Mike is, is a rock star. So. Um, I, my understanding in regards to the ordinance with general assistance is that if we're working with the state and we're accepting and adopting the maximums and the ordinances that they propose, the expectation is that we're offering this resource for all essential needs um, as, as designated by the state. So it's rent, it's food, it's non-food, it's electrical, it's heat, and it's help with prescriptions. So kind of what I consider the beauty of having general assistance down at FCS is that 
outside of those needs, we now have the resources through FCS to assist people beyond. Um, and it really seems to help and, and be um, a, a more inclusive or, or whole approach to, to just really addressing what folks are going through. Sarah, I, I'd just add that I think Ed's base question of can we be more generous, the answer is obviously yes. Yes. Maybe not through GA, but the town could spend town funds or, or Freeport Community Services could spend right. private funds on that. That wouldn't be a problem with the state. No. But being and less, being less uh, generous, that's not a great term, but less, uh, more stingy than the state requires and not giving out the, the funds as required would put us in disapproval eventually of the state, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think we would essentially be adopting our own um, independent kind of ordinance, and that's what we would have to propose to the state, and then we would risk losing funding. And we would also have to meet the state statutory requirements and any constitutional type arguments right. that somebody might make that we're not helping meet right. the intent of the law, the general assistance law. Right, right. And I'm, there is some flexibility with the general assistance program, so certainly there are circumstances that warrant an exception. You know, there's, especially when we're looking at, you know, a family who's homeless in the community and they need to be hoteled, we, because there's no shelter, we know there's no shelter, we know the housing situation is pretty dire. You know, there are exceptions that can be made to make sure that that family remains safe. Um, we also have the option, you know, where we have a food pantry here at the community center, maybe we're not giving the full maximum of food because we're also then encouraging and helping those those folks to either get home deliveries and have access to what we have in the pantry or just consider other resources so that it doesn't fall entirely on the town and then the state uh, to cover those expenses. Did I, did I answer your question okay? Close to it? Mo it was a great answer, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> All right, any other questions? We've already got a motion on the floor, so if there's no other questions, we'll take a vote. Councillor Pillsbury? Aye. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Daniele? Yes. Councillor Bradley? Yes. Councillor Egan? Yes. And the chair votes yes, so six to zero. We now have new maximums and an updated GA ordinance. Thank you. And just one more thing, can we get signatures too? Um, Okay, perfect. Sorry, sorry to be during the headlights. Um, you're not going anywhere soon, right? You're sticking around till yeah, the we'll, end, so yeah, we'll we'll, we'll make it happen. We'll, we'll find we'll it. We'll get it before you we'll walk out it. in 30 minutes. We'll, we'll be done in 30 minutes, and that's when you'll be leaving, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah um, Chris, do we do we have a clean copy? Now that you said that, of course, we'll be here a lot longer. Yeah, I, well, uh, as long as John doesn't say it, we're never. It's not usually a problem. When John says we're going to be real quick, that's when we get thrown in our face. So. That's right. Um, all right. Next up, we have item 188-22 uh, regarding setting a public hearing for our next meeting uh, regarding amendments for non-conforming lots. Are you doing the intro on this? I would love to do the intro right. on this. I'd love so, for you to do it. Um, Caroline's here, even though this was mine to inter intro, so maybe, I don't know, maybe I will make her do it. No, just kidding. Um, this one is, uh, let's rewind all the way. You may remember a couple years ago we had some conversations about, those that were on the council had conversations about shoreland zoning lots that um, were non-conforming dimensionally that were then added onto and could not be divided. And we went to the state, we got some um, special exceptions made and to some of those lots they were taken out of some of those dimensional standards. Um, this does not apply to shoreland zoning. This this applies to everything else that's outside of the shoreland zone in town. Um, in our zoning ordinance, the definition of a non-conforming lot of record is a, a, a lot that doesn't comply with zoning at the time zoning is instituted. So when zoning was originally instituted, you, let's say you have a lot that dimensionally doesn't comply. It's half an acre, and you need two and a half acres in that zone. That lot, grandfathered is the term, um, which is not the correct legal term, but it's often thrown around in, in, that, in these type of discussions. That lot then is considered a non-conforming or a legal lot, um, non-conforming legal lot. The 
and that lasts forever as long as you don't change that dimension that's that's essentially the violation under the new ordinance. So if you keep your lot at 0.5 acres forever, you're considered a non-conforming lot of record. You can build it. You get certain protections under the zoning ordinance where you don't have to meet that standard. Um, the problem often comes, and this is this happens a few times every couple of years. Somebody has a lot that is let's we'll just limit it to dimensions for now. So either isn't the right acreage, doesn't have the right frontage. Um, doesn't have correct setbacks or something like that where the building is. Um, happens occasionally, more frequently than you expect. Somebody will alter the dimensions of the lot. And this is usually done in the positive direction, sometimes in the negative direction, which is always a problem. So someone has half an acre and they divide in half and sell 0.25 acres to their neighbor. When the town finds out about it, now you've created two violations because now both of those lots are no longer conforming. Uh, lots of non-conforming lots of record and they're smaller than they're supposed to be. Usually it goes in the other direction. Somebody will add on to their lot, um, like neighbors selling an acre, and you'll merge an acre and half an acre together, and it's making it better, right? Um, however, legally that's not the case. The town, since at least 2004, we had an opinion from the town attorney, probably many before that, but that's as far as I could go back. Um, Chris Vaniotis was the town attorney at the time. Um, I know that it was confirmed by Jeff Hole, who I worked with, and Phil Saucier after Jeff, and now Amy is also of the same opinion. So we've received continuous advice from town attorneys when these issues come up that, nope, that usually involves a consent agreement with the council. So somebody will come. They now have a, a lot that's a violation, but for all intents and purposes, the council can be like, great, you made it better. Fine. You can keep the, you can keep the violation, even though it's not a, a conforming lot of record. We don't have to do it that way. We can change our zoning ordinance. There's no state law outside of the shoreland zone that says we have to have it that way. In fact, lots of towns and cities, don't know if it's the majority, I know there are several, have provisions in their zoning ordinance that if you change the dimensions of a lot of record, you don't make the nonconformity worse, then you're fine. So, for example, somebody who has half an acre in a two and a half acre zone and adds an acre, that one and a half acres, as long as you don't make another violation happen while you're doing that, you're, you're good. Um, if you don't have frontage and you make you increase your frontage but not enough to get all the way up to what you need, you're good. So um, would that still be a legally non-conforming lot? Or do you, you actually... You do not lose your legal non, your non-conforming status. So you're, you're not conforming, meaning you don't meet the standards in zoning, but you've added on to it and you've made the non-conformity less of a problem. Right. Um, so that is what is proposed here. This came from the planning board. Um, we did have a, a specific case that it's applying to, but this is not just one. This is something that was identified um, by our code officer at least four and a half years ago. He started here five years ago. I think four and a half years ago is he found it. It doesn't come up that often, um, but his recommendation years ago was that we change it. It's finally gotten through the planning board process. We've got it here. Um, I can't imagine this being a problem because I can't envision a situation where someone makes a nonconformity better and then a butter is angry about that. Um, there are some instances, I know the planning board was talking about it, they were batting around, okay, maybe if the frontage isn't right and you've got a lot of back acreage, maybe that allows something to be buildable. That's a possibility. Um, but really it's allowing people who make their nonconformity better to utilize their lot and to do something. Because you really can't do anything if you make a nonconforming, if you lose your, your nonconforming status, your legally nonconforming status, you can't really do anything. The lot's a violation. You're not going to get a building permit to enlarge a structure, even if it's not into a setback, even if it's somewhere that would be legal otherwise. We shouldn't be issuing permission for anything on that lot until the violation is corrected, which would be, you know, something stupid like selling the lot, the, ha the acre on the one and a half acre lot, selling the acre back to the abutter and making it the original dimensions or something like that. That would be kind of foolish, um, counterproductive, I think. The legal standard is there. The way our ordinance is written requires us to call that a violation and requires us not to issue any approvals for anything that wants to happen on that lot. So this is an attempt to change that and make it so people can add on to their lot, alter dimensions, things like that, as long as it doesn't make the non-conforming part worse. So for example, if you had another example would be frontage. You have 100 feet, you know, you have 100 feet of frontage, your zone calls for 200. I don't think there's any zone that does call for that exact number, but just for the sake of argument, and you have 100 acres behind you. You really can't, if you make your frontage bigger or, you know, you fix the problem where you add land onto your lot um, in the back, let's say you do that, you add land onto your lot and you don't have frontage, you've just 
lost your non-conforming status by adding land to a 100-acre parcel, which would make no sense. Um, that's one example. Another example is like altering dimensions of a lot to make it where you have a violation or something like that, less of a violation. Like if you have a side setback violation, you, you know, you add land on the side. You even though you're still, you might still be in violation. You've lost your non-conforming status. So, a whole bunch of scenarios where people can get into trouble by trying to do what would seem like common sense thing to solve a problem or make a problem less bad. Absolutely. I'm assuming this is coming to us, you mentioned, from the planning board. So the planning board's already had public hearings on this? They did. And did I they get public participation? Do we know? Limited. Yes, they got public participation. Okay. I was one. I was 50% of the public participation, so I don't feel like I want to talk that, that up yeah. too much. So, okay. um, Well, it's just that's one of those things where, you know, this is one of those items that's totally down in the weeds until it's you know, your neighbor or your lot or whatever, and then it's a big thing. And that's why I was wondering if we had any participation at the planning board level before we... Yeah, I think they were unanimous, I think, on this one. Yeah. I mean, I see the public notice in the memo yep. here, so we're trying to get it out, but... Uh, like to have more, just like that, more, more attention, I guess, on this, because I, I agree with the effort here is to make it easier for people to improve their non-conformity in, in terms of their land land use. So we should be encouraging that and making it easier for them, I guess, that's my point. So with that said, uh, and I'm not sure whether well, Carolina, you, Peter, can answer my question. Uh, we passed the recommendation from the planning board to adopt this. I walk in, I've added uh, half an acre to my one acre non-conformity lot I had, Walk me through. I want to put it, put a new building on it. Walk me through it. What's going to happen? You mean if this is in place? Yep. Um, so assuming you dimensionally met everything, your building wasn't in a setback violation or anything like that. You have to follow the standards of the zone. So you have, and Caroline, chime in anytime. I'm getting off topic here. You think I need to add something? So you have to meet the standards, all the standards for the zone, except the thing that you are grandfathered under so the lot acreage the if it's coverage or if it's acreage um that would not be counted against you but you still have to make sure you build your building the correct distance from the front side we are any of the setbacks that your lot coverage that your use is correct it doesn't give you the right to you know create an industrial use in a residential zone and anymore um whatever the thing is that you that caused the non-conformity that's ignored everything else you have to meet the standards and who will make that decision? That's done. So that's, you mean whether or not the law conforms? Whether or not the permit is issued to a non conform law. Done at building permit application by the code officer. And that will be done locally at the code office. Yes. Okay. Yep. At, at the time of building permit. It's, it, so these it's come up. Requested. These yeah. usually come up at building permit applications when um, part of the building permit is to make sure it's a legal lot and that there's not any violations on it. So when that's usually when it comes up that hey there's a there's something in the chain of title that's different than what it looks like it was in 1986 or in 2003 whenever that standard was adopted through zoning. So I, I just want to make sure that we don't have a lot of extra other hoops. I, I want to make the process smooth, easy, <laughs> and and if the, I, I, the way I'm reading this, hopefully that will achieve that. Yeah, I hope that this would take a hurdle out of the way of somebody. Um, that is not every day we see this, but a couple times a year maybe. Um, and it also makes what it will do is a lot of these cases are solvable. So, but it would come to the council for a consent agreement. So it's a month, two month process maybe for that to happen just to allow somebody to do something that they're allowed to do in many municipalities in the state anyways. Um, so this would take it uh, it's it's basically us saying that we don't need to see all of these at the council level to be comfortable that it can happen. So if you don't want to do this, you can expect probably some of the people that would otherwise have an issue to have a reasonable case to the council for a consent agreement. Um, hey, I've made my problem better. Why can't I build on the lot? Caroline has her hand up. 
Um, so to respond to Daryl's question, I think the intent of this amendment is to remove something that's been identified as a barrier for certain residents. I'm not sure if we've consistently been in past practice um, enforcing this ordinance as written, but it's pretty clear when it's written. And then I also had a suggestion for a friendly amendment to the language you have before you tonight. Can, sorry, can you guys still hear me? There's some weird stuff going on on Zoom. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the no, way you just this... you just got a weird visual feedback loop. I put you up on the screen and uh, can yeah, uh, I've done this apparently by spotlighting your feed for everybody to look at. So carry on, Caroline. We can see you in very small. <laughs> um, so there would I would like to propose a friend, friendly amendment to the language you have here. So you have alteration of non-conforming lots, a non-conforming lot legally existing as of the effective date of this ordinance. So that would be when it was first adopted in 1976. I would suggest that we look at D1 and we add in or an amendment of this ordinance. And so what that would mean is if you had somebody that their lot predates the zoning ordinance, you know, their lot's been in place since 19. 75, they could add land to it and still be considered non-conforming. But I think if we're really trying to be flexible, we would also want to grant that same opportunity to someone whose lot may have come become non-conforming by a zoning amendment. Say we changed the minimum lot size or we rezoned their property. So adding those couple of words, that's what that would address. And we would do that at, after the public hearing, any amendments. So we could have that in writing for the next meeting probably does that sound yeah reasonable? sorry that came up as last minute when i was doing my memo for you i, I like oh we're we accidentally left out a small a very small bracket of people that you know but can become non-conforming as we continue to amend our ordinance to to be fair that would impact anybody who like if the minimum lot side was changed if you were like an acre when there was half acre zoning and they made it two and a half and you know i know that that's probably not a good example because it's all on route one self i think where those um, lot size changes a good happen, example right? i think could be you know we had an old subdivision ordinance that was in place after zoning so we have areas where we have acre lots where now we would require two and a half acres um you know that's a good example we have some new zones like we have the village mixed use those were added in more recent time, not in 1976, but, you know, in the 2000s. And so I think if we really want to be fair and make sure we're trying to help our residents to remove an additional barrier, we would want to make sure we're catching those people as well. Okay. Okay. So we can talk about all that next, next meeting. Next public hearing, yeah. But I know this is longer than a five-minute intro. It's a little bit thorny of a subject. Mm -hmm. I don't think... I don't see any downsides. I'm sure if there is one, someone will find it and tell us before next meeting. But um, I can't really see any situation other than somebody making a problem better, but not going all the way to fix it, getting penalized for it. That's really what, that's who gets caught in these situations. Okay. Oh, we've got a hand up from Councillor Daniele. Go ahead. If I make my lot better, and then like, let's say I had an acre lot, I add a half an acre, and then I sell a different half acre, so now I'm back to an acre. Is that allowed under this? Or is that, is once you've made it better, are you allowed to make it go back towards the smaller size again? No, not unless you get over the requirement, you can go down to the minimum requirement. Because the intent is that, um, I think that we always try to make properties come into, that's why the non-conformity clause exists you want the property to come into conformance eventually um so the goal is to get you to two and a half acres if you're in a two and a half acre zone um you could go over it and then go back down if you started off as non-conforming you just couldn't go backwards away from two and a half so once i add to my property i'm not allowed to go back like what if i like i bought a property for a half an acre and then i decided to sell that property for it that's the half an acre that's the same one I'm just interested is in the ordinance, does it allow you to do that or not? It doesn't currently. And uh, Caroline, do you want to chime in? I don't think it would under the current standard, right? I would say my initial instinct would be no, but that's just my instinct. I think that's a legal question that we could get some clarification on for you for the public hearing. 
Thank you. When, when you change the dimensions, so the meets and the bounds of your recorded deed, so when you had a deed transaction, that's when you actually lose the non-conforming, uh, legal non-conforming status. So going back even would probably still require a consent agreement, an, uh, an admission by the town council that the violation, we knew that it exists at the town level and we're gonna bless it and allow it to continue. That's probably the way you would be able to do it. Which maybe you can make a case that that's reasonable on the buying the half acre, selling the half acre, that may politically be acceptable to the town, but it would not, it would be outside the zoning ordinance. Well, I didn't want somebody to be able to, let's say, I bought this half acre and then I sold a different half acre and my lot still qualifies, but now I've got this nicer section, even though I've, I've made it better and then made it back to worse, but it's actually, I don't know. I could see it getting complicated. That sounds like a regular Tuesday in Caroline's department. So. <laughs> That's an, a really interesting, you know, we always try to look at the pros and cons internally and as a planning board meeting, and that's one creative idea we did not look at. So I think it's worth doing a little more due diligence because, you know, no matter what we do, somebody's going to try to take advantage. All right. Any other comment? Anybody here to talk about non-conforming lots, by the way? I don't, guessing not, but just want to check. Uh, you can. We have a public hearing on the 20th, but you're welcome to offer some uh, thoughts. If you've got to step up to the podium, though, just to tell us who you are. Sure. Just, sure. Okay. Yeah. So my name's Scott Poulin. I live at 55 Baker Road, and um, I happen to be one of those individuals that um, thought I was doing something great by becoming more conforming. Um, I have a campground that's going in next to my house. Um, there's a lot of work that's been going on there. And um, I took my non-conforming lot, made an agreement with the owner of the campground to say, let's create a little bit of a buffer here to help me out. And uh, we added a very small section. I mean, it's not even a quarter of an acre. It's, you know, maybe less than 3,000 square feet just to keep uh, things going. And in adjacent to that, I was looking to uh, move the garage that I have on my property and turn it so that I would be blocking and not be able to see the campground. And that was the whole intent. So when I came in to get a building permit, um, I was completely caught off guard because the irony of it all is, is if I had done nothing, I could have got a permit, okay, and moved my garage. Uh, now that I've added to my property, I've now become a new non-conforming lot and fall under this um, uh, you know, ordinance where I can't get a permit for anything, and I've now created a problem with all the good intentions were to help make my lot more conforming and also create a buffer for myself and uh, be good neighbors with my uh, you know, new campground next door. So I'm one of the folks that falls into this. Um, I've been here 27 years in Freeport. My family's grown up here and lived here for a number of years. and. Uh, this was a pretty ironic uh, ordinance for me when it came about because um, it makes absolutely no sense. Okay. Thanks that's, for sharing that. That kind of dri it. drives it home, you know? Yeah, I think that's yeah. a perfect example of why most municipalities have already, or many municipalities have already like put language like this in mm -hmm. to deal with these exact situations. So, yeah. yep, perfect. We got, we got to get with the times, is my take. So, yeah. Stick around for October 20th. All right. Yeah. Uh, as will we all, I hope. Um, if there's no other comment, uh, Councillor. It's the 18th, actually. Oh, is it? Uh, it is 14, yeah. yeah. So we should change this, right? Public hearing be set for October 18th, not October 20th. Good catch. Do you want to change the date as you read the uh, beat order? Sure. Uh, be it ordered that a public hearing be set for October 18th, 2022, at the town council meeting that starts at 6 p.m to discuss proposed amendments to section 202.d non-conforming lots of record of chapter 21 town of freeport zoning ordinance second thank you councillor pillsbury any other comment all right so we'll take a vote to set the public hearing councillor pillsbury aye councillor fournier yes councillor Danielli. yes councillor bradley yes councillor egan yes the chair votes yes for a six to zero passage of our public ordinance. And I assume this is posted in the normal places, but we're not saying that it's posted in normal places anymore to make our meetings go faster. So notices are posted on TV, at the library, town hall, etc. cetera. Um, okay, our last action item for tonight is item 189-22. We're gonna end on a high note. Adam's done a ton of work on this. I won't take his thunder, and I'll let him introduce the, the topic. 
Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Adam Bliss. I proudly serve as your town engineer. I am here tonight with good news, great news, actually. Um, I worked with Brett Richardson, our free FEDC director, um, to apply for a hometown grant, which is given out by T-Mobile um, to uh, municipalities that submit an application for community projects such as parks, uh, river walks, um, art sculptures. Um, our project out here at Town Hall was submitted as, uh, we submitted as an applicant for the Town Hall project. Um, uh, they, 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 they give out, uh, well, they're planning on giving out $25 million over five years to communities throughout the United States. Um, they do them in quarterly increments. Uh, in quarter two of 2022, they had 500 applicants. Um, and uh, there were two municipalities within Maine that were awarded grants for investment into community, in, into community infrastructure. Um, Ellsworth and the town of Freeport. Um, it's quite rare to have two municipalities in the same state, but um, here we are. And, uh, and just to, they had 500 applications. Um, Freeport and Ellsworth were selected. Um, last year, just Augusta was selected. So um, great news for us all. That, what, what this grant does is it helps um, make town hall site beautification project um, financially feasible without asking a lot from the taxpayers. Um, and uh, with construction pricing the way it is and labor in such short supply, um, we're starting in the spring, we're gonna make this town hall project happen. So um, I could go on, but uh, there's more business to talk about tonight. So why don't I open it up for questions and uh, hurrah. I'll start, first of all, thank you, Adam for all the work you, you've put into this. Um, and also, as you've mentioned, uh, Brett Richardson from FEDC was kind of at your side putting this in. Uh, and a lot of people ask sort of, what does FEDC do? And this is one of the things that, that they do. And I know Brett was an enthusiastic supporter of trying to apply for this and, and bring it in. And um, uh, I think they, you know, they make a difference by attracting money to Freeport in lots of different ways, this being one of them. Um, can I talk about October 11th? Please do. So October 11th, which is a week from today, big day, we have a, uh, a workshop where we're gonna talk about the, the progress of our downtown vision. But at the start of that workshop, uh, we're gonna take some time uh, to thank T-Mobile for the grant. Uh, and they've generously offered to buy some food for us. So if you come to the workshop on October 11th, you get free food. So. <laughs> that we're bribing you to show up, but we're encouraging you to show up by offering some food thanks to T-Mobile. Um, so that's October 11th, next Tuesday at 6 o'clock. That's going to be at the community center because that's going to be more of a walk around, talk to the people who have been working on the downtown vision, talk to all of the counselors who have will be there because um, that will be a good opportunity for us to interact with the downtown vision folks and with the public. Um, so I bring that up now because of the T-Mobile piece at the beginning, uh, which will be... Tuesday, October 11th, 6 o'clock at the Community Center. Mm -hmm. Councilor Egan. Um, I'm sure that the design and the drawings that were put forward in the application had a significant um, impact on their decision to award the grant uh, because they were compelling drawings. Is there a way for the public to get to see this? We're making a big hubbub about this. Congratulations on the work. I think it's fabulous that we got this grant. Uh, and I would agree that that's a um, small reminder of what having FEDC in our community does for us. Is there a way for the public to actually pretty easily or readily get to see uh, a rendering and possibly even a 3D rendering on a screen somewhere of what these improvements are going to look like? It's a dramatic facelift for the front of town hall is my point. Yep. And it would be great to get some enthusiasm from the general public. Easy. Um, we can do that at least three ways. One. Um, We'll have a display board during the open house that will show the site plan. It'll be a colored rendering. 
I'll stand next to it. I'll inform people that haven't heard much about it um, what we're up to. Uh, secondly, we can post the plans on the website. And third, uh, in a couple weeks, I go before Project Review Board for approval of the project. And that, that meeting is obviously a public process. And so um, everything is available for, uh, for viewing. Is there any chance it could be on the rotation circuit on the screens out in the lobby? Wow, outside of the box. Um, sure, I don't see why not. I mean, they're just, uh, for people coming in for whatever business they have at Town Hall, that may be their only interaction with Town Hall, yeah. physically. And it would be great for them to be able to see that image um, of what's coming. Great idea. Or whatever plans are left over from the PRB, we could mm -hmm. easel one right in the mm -hmm. lobby way like we did with the downtown stuff. Excellent idea. I know it's not as flashy. John's idea was a little more technologically advanced. So with that, it falls on us to formally accept the grant. Uh, so we have to vote on that. So if anybody doesn't want to, here's your chance to object. But if everybody does want to, here's your chance to be uh, supportive of it. So pardon, Councillor Pillsbury. Pardon, pardon me, Dan. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, did, I, did I leave out the amount of the, the award? Uh, it's no, it's in, in the It's in the order. It's in the write-up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's a big deal. How much so. is it? Fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> and, and where can people see the uh, the uh, plans in addition to town hall? Uh, the display board um, at the workshop. Which is when? <laughs> nice. October eleventh, six p.m. <laughs> and where is it? Report Community Center. Perfect. Thank you, Al. <laughs> We've got a uh, hand up from oh. Councillor Bradley in the audience. Okay, Councillor. Uh, uh, sorry, in the panel, I in should panel. say. Councillor Bradley. So. Uh, congratulations um, are in order and congratulations. Um, but it gives me a, a question. Um, we are in a revision process. October 11th, as Dan points out, is one of the first times the council will get to hear about the priorities these standing committees have done. Um, and this doesn't, this question is related to this grant, but it's not designed or intended to question the grant or the effort or the success or the achievement. But it seems that it gives, it makes me wonder in the future, if Brett and let's say Peter uh, go, off, go after a grant that's and get it, that's in the context of one of the priorities that's under consideration by the standing committees, the street gang, all the people who are sort of officially and unofficially gathering around the prioritization process. Um, does that take that out and to say that's a priority? I, I know, for instance, let me use this one. This is part of a, of a, of a plan that connects to a couple of other ideas for <clears throat> the town hall or properties surrounding the town hall. Um, Maybe that was going to be discussed in greater detail, maybe not. Um, but from now on, what we're going to do is what's in this grant, because it's set out in this grant, because that's that's what we went for and we got now. We got $50,000. And as I said, congratulations. But how does all of this grantsmanship that we conduct, as much as I applaud it and think it's necessary and critical to protect the taxpayer, how does it relate to the prioritization process that we are going through. How did this one relate to that and how will future ones relate to that? Should should grant applications come before the council for approval or through, is there some way that that decision about prioritization of that for funding affect the prioritization of that for doing? I, I, I keep coming back to process and I, I apologize for it, but it, it bedevils me. I could I could take a stab at, at this one because I think it's um, it's pretty straightforward. The, the town hall beautification project had already been approved before we finalized our downtown vision plan. So the project was really something that existed separate and apart from the downtown vision. So when the opportunity came up to say we, we have an option of going for a grant, we were going for a grant for a project that the council had already approved. So it wasn't a, a new project that 
went through the machinations of is it part of our downtown vision plan or not part of a downtown vision plan um, uh, yeah I mean that, that that's the easy answer for this one um, there's obviously more we could talk about process but but that's that's a quick answer if that's enough for you do you, do you have more or is that sufficient I well, it, it tells me, I mean, I don't remember it that way, Dan, but that's okay. You're the chair and you do know it and I don't. I remember us saying, hey, to Adam when he presented it, um, take a step back. Whole, whole course, we have a bunch of things we're going to discuss in revision that relate to that. So let's see how they all interrelate and then we'll figure out how they, they work together. That's my recollection, but I'm probably wrong. But having said that, um, going forward, the question's the same. You know, are, are is the town going to... Uh, aggressively pursue grants for things which are sort of in the in the prioritization list and therefore prioritize that way or are we going to wait until we have gotten our priorities straight and and sat and then go after grants or is it something in the middle or haven't we decided yet or i i don't know but this one made me think uh, hard about that and i don't pose anything that's in the approved plan that's not the point it's it, it's that i really would like us to know how we're going to approach prioritization of the downtown revision plan yeah so uh, that larger question is is a good one um and to kind of preview where i think we're heading is next tuesday at our workshop we'll be talking about which pieces of the large plan we think we can start working on today and which goals we want to adopt. So Tuesday, we'll be having that discussion as a council and with the public, and hopefully with some public input, uh, with people advising us saying, we think this project is important or that goal is important. After that's done, what I would propose to my colleagues up here is to say, now that we have all that input as a council, we, you know, we've had the presentation from uh, all the downtown vision workshops. We've had this this public workshop on the 11th with the recommendations from the task force. So now it's up to us to say, are these indeed our priorities, or do we want to change the priorities that are being recommended? Uh, either one is fine. Uh, my guess is that will start to happen maybe in October, but continue to happen between now and the end of the year uh, when we'll be setting our council priorities for the following year. So that would be our time as a council to say, yep, these recommendations are great and we're gonna stick with them, or they're mostly great and we wanna tweak them a little bit. Um, but that's what I hope we'll do as a council in the next several meetings between now and the end of the year. Once that's done, you know, whether or not we allow people to apply for grants on their own, whether we want them to run it by council first or run it by Peter first or some other group, it's all up for discussion. I don't have strong opinions on that. Um, I think if we set the goals and priorities, it will hopefully be somewhat obvious or there will at least be some guidelines in place as to what things we should be interested in and what things are just not a priority at the moment. <clears throat> uh, Can I just take one more yep. moment? Of course. So, again, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I, I've been involved in prioritization projects both privately and publicly. and. <laughs> To some extent, your prioritization depends on how you fund it and what does it cost and who pays for it. And since grantsmanship is a big part of how we're we expect to pay for a number of the things we might think we want, I guess that I would like on the 11th or at some point for us to um, talk about and set a policy about um, funding um, so that we know how it fits into uh, so the, the prioritization process. So we're not just simply saying, I like that one because it's, it's apple green and it tastes like mint, um, but because I, I, we think we can afford it and because it won't affect the, the taxpayer negatively. Um, or it will affect the taxpayer negatively, but it's so important we really think we should do it. Or it, <laughs> we really think we should do it and we can fund half of it by grants and we should go after them. I, I don't know how that all works in this process. Um, but I think we should have a discussion about how we want it to work before it takes over the whole process. 100% agree sorry, with you. Sorry to belabor it, but I'm, 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 and anyway, that's what I saw. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you, Ed. I think that's a discussion we should have for sure. Yeah, um, California. Yeah. Uh, I'm throwing on my old retired fire chief's hat, and uh, used to be the case. I'm sure it's still the case now, where we encourage all department heads to look for grants all the time. So I think what Ed is recommending, uh, I, I think we have two or three levels of grants that the town staff applies for and, and where the council comes in. Uh, as an example, you know, the IFG grant that, uh, for fire service for air packs, whatever you name, uh, that comes out every year, and we used to apply every year, we were very successful. Speaking as an old fire chief, probably a grumpy old fire chief, I don't want another hoop to come through before the council to slow the process down. That's, that's me speaking as a former department head. Uh, however, I, I, I will agree with that on some other aspects where we need to go. So maybe the discussion down the road is, you know, I don't want to have a, a, a blanket thrown over all of our grant processes, and I don't want to discourage our department heads from applying for grants. But maybe, you know, a little guidance, but I don't want to put more burden on the process. Because believe me, the grant writing process is burdened enough for the people that do it. Did you want to add to that? Not, not much. <laughs> um, I think the point of making sure, so I, I do want to say for this one, um, I know the question that you guys are talking about right now is much bigger than right. this specific one. I know it was brought uh, to our attention by Brett, right, um, who identified it as a potential opportunity and all of the factors that made it successful were the the fact that it was included in the downtown plan um, where there was a major grant application going i think and it, it, we weren't looking at the downtown plan i think the first thing when adam and brett came to me would have been like hey is there something in the downtown plan that we could be focusing on that meets the criteria for this grant we've got a lot of projects um, i think for this specific one it's listed in the plan and it's also kind of in pre-production there were draft documents there are things that adam could submit with it there were there were drawings there were designs um it's shovel mostly shovel ready or it, we have a date where it will be shovel ready um you know in the next six months that allowed it to be successful i don't think any of the other things that are in the plan would have met the criteria for this round of application so i, I think it, that kind of was applied in this case just to give people sorry for that on the screen just to give people kind of confidence that we did look at things in the downtown plan. I know that was something Brett was looking at when he looked at what we could possibly apply for and the shovel ready status of it kind of being pre downtown plan put on hold and then going right. forward with it where it fell in the pipeline really allowed it to be applied for in this case. Um, I don't think any of those other plans we could have gone for one next year for the same program for some of the downtown other items. So it doesn't mean we couldn't have done it that way. And that may be what the council wants to strategically look at those going forward. But all those things were considered in this application. So, Good. any other comments, council or otherwise? All right, Council Pillsbury, would you do the honors? Sure. Um, no, Adam, you don't have to incorporate any uh, pink design elements in the in this project. Do you, based on who gave us the money? <laughs> no. All right. Uh, be it ordered that a grant in the amount of $50,000 from T-Mobile for the purposes of town hall site beautification project be approved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Uh, Councillor Pillsbury, how would you like to vote? Aye. Councillor Fournier. Yes. Councillor Danielli. Yes. Councillor Bradley. Yes. Councillor Egan. Yes. And the chair votes yes, six to zero. Congratulations again. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Bliss, Mr. Richardson, and everyone else who was involved. Um, so that concludes, I believe, the vote-taking portion of our meeting, but we still have three pretty interesting items to discuss. We've got three discussion items in our other business. Uh, we have stretch codes. We have um, grant uh, money for FCS, and we have uh, some mountain bike trails to talk about. So I'm guessing by the numbers in the room that there are a lot of folks here to talk about stretch codes. Is that right? Is he some nodding heads in the room? Okay. Um, are there folks here to talk about uh, ARPA grants and FCS or mountain Can bikes? I, <laughs> right. I figured you'd be here for that. Uh, or mountain bikes? I don't have a question about that. Sure. Oh. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. yeah. I'm just trying to get a sense for timing. Um, 
So for, for building codes, um, what I'd suggest is the managers put together a memo just sort of explaining what, what it's all about. So maybe you can kind of give us an overview of that. And then we can talk about what our current plans are, and how we're, we currently are thinking about how to deal with building codes. Um, we're not taking any action on it tonight that uh, I anticipate. Um, but then after we do that, after we get the overview and kind of you, you hear about our, our current plans, then we can open it up and kind of hear from, from the public on what you all want to share with your thoughts. So with that, Mr. Manager, yeah. you want to Yeah, I'll, I'll lead off. I think we've got um, audience members tonight. I know this has been a current topic at both the uh, Freeport Climate Action Now, the FCAN group, and the Freeport Sustainability Advisory Board, the FSAB group, that's the official town board, and the very involved, interested public group is FCAN uh, that's been also following this. So I know that that's on both of their... Uh, priority lists or, or topic lists that they're they're watching. Um, just as a real basic for anyone watching or anyone on the council, the main uniform building and energy code, which is MUBEC, which we're all sick of hearing about by now after several items. Um, it's uh, MUBEC is a program established by the legislature that applies to all towns in Maine. Um, there are different levels. Uh, we're a municipality over 4,000 people, so we enforce and use all of MUBEC as our standards and have for many, many years. So there's no, this isn't anything new. There are individual com uh, codes that make up MUBEC. Those are the uh, the residential code, the building code, the um, existing building code, the energy conservation code, and the mechanical code. So, the, the for example, building code is new construction. Existing building code is if there's an existing building and you're building onto it. So you're adding onto it or altering it. So these are standards. Uh, they're all the 2015 standards currently that have been adopted by the state of Maine that we are required to follow in any regulation of building or permitting that we do. So it should be the same in all municipalities, roughly of you know half our size and larger, all are under these standards. Um, they are updated every three years. You'll notice it's 2015. The state is lagging pretty severely. We, there are. 18 codes, there are 21 codes that exist in each of these standards that have been adopted. Three years is a typical cycle that the different code uh, agencies release them on. So the, um, the codes that are adopted by the state of Maine, 15, 18, 21, they're on a three-year cycle. Um, it's such a lengthy process because they don't just, they're not just adopted you know, as written, there's a whole bunch of political, there's a, there's a committee at the state level that goes through, certifies these things, gets input from fire departments, from code officers, from building departments, from, you know, the contractors, from electric utilities, from lumber producers, everybody is involved in this. So that's at the state level. The state has to make potential modifications or maybe leave things in or take or add things to whatever there is that they adopt. So there's a lengthy state political process that comes after the officials at these nonprofits and for-profit companies that write the codes. After they're adopted and released, there's now a political filter before they get adopted statewide and before any changes that are made are made. So that's why we're always three years back. I would say, I'd say they're always three years back. They're supposed to be three years back. But in this case, we're essentially six years back, more now, seven years now. So. Um, the stretch code applies specifically to the energy conservation code. Um, the state, the um, the state allows MUBEC and the state standards allow municipalities to go beyond what's required. And by beyond, well, what what do you mean? Well, I mean energy codes typically increase over time. It's government policy that. Um, most states, Maine being one of them, wants to increase energy efficiency of new construction. Um, in Maine, that doesn't involve going back and retrofitting existing buildings, some that are energy inefficient or not built to modern construction standards, but it does mean new houses, uh, every time there's a new code iteration that's adopted by the state, there's a new, usually higher energy code standard that's applied. So that could be increasing R values, which are the, how you measure the insulation properties of different building materials. It could be implementing new technologies like sealing doors, windows, sealing, SEAL uh, sealing, not roof sealing. Um, and it could also involve like new standards like in the existing code, like blower door test, for example, being a new technology that builders have to do to test how leaky in terms of air uh, infiltration of houses when, they, when they're done doing the shelf. 
That's not a new technology, by the way. No, it's not new, but it's it's new to the code world. Um, it's new to many builders. Uh, I guess the best way to put it is a traditional stick frame builder just builds houses, now has to understand air sealing and has to understand how blower door testing works. Um, before it was like, you know, how to how you frame a house correctly. Now you also have to, this new thing that everybody who builds in Maine has to understand how that works and has to build a compliant house. So you can't, you can, as a builder, you can't commercially build a house without passing that, or at least you're not supposed to. And it's not supposed to pass final inspection under the energy code, a new construction house. So what that means is that essentially over, you know, every three years or however often these codes are updated, the energy code is updated. There are new standards put in place, which ratchet up the energy efficiency of construction. Um, the end goal being that buildings should be more energy efficient and should be um, you know, less costly to operate in the long term and use less heating uh, energy, whether it's fuel or electricity or whatever, to heat those homes or cool those homes because they're better insulated and air sealed. Um, so that's kind of the why things are adopted the way they are increasing each time. Currently, um, currently, Mubeck allows us to go um, forward, and the current stretch code is the 2021 code. We're expecting that the 2021 all of the, that entire list of codes will change to 2021 in, I think we talked about this, like sometime in the next six months, the first six months of next year. Uh, they're, they're never going to get there. They're going. Well, we're, we're hopeful that eventually we may be six months ahead of the curve here. It's sounding, I'm not really involved in that process. John, I think you might be too. I know Bob's been following it. I know a couple members of the committees have been following it. Um, but this would allow us to adopt the energy code ahead of the mandatory date that we'll have to adopt it anyways. Um, I listed some pros and cons. It's not exhaustive, but I think it kind of summarizes the issue. Increased energy efficiency is a good thing. Decreased energy costs over the lifetime of a structure is a good thing. Um, and decreased environmental impact from energy consumption. You're just using less energy. So regardless of where you stand on the issue, whether that's important or not, it's a fact that a building that's better insulated uses less heating and cooling. Um, whether that's important to you depends on whether that's something that is important to you. Um, it, it does have a potential upside of increased building comfort, a nicer structure to live in, a uh, more comfortable structure to live in. You don't have those cold floors like in my house because it was built 60 years ago. Um, you know, in the morning when you get up, you don't have to burn four gallons of oil to heat the whole house up. Um, if it's constructed correctly, and that's very important. If it's not constructed correctly, and by constructed correctly, we mean ventilation, uh, air handling, the, the things like that. There are some negatives for if new codes are implemented and people don't fully understand how to do them, and that can be moisture problems, um, health issues as a result of that. The goal is eventually those don't occur, but as new technologies are adopted, those are things that our code officer points out that he's always had concerns about people getting to the point where they know what they're doing enough not to create those problems. Um, and that's a learning curve for anybody building a house, not just seal it as tight as you can and close all the doors. Um, things stop running and you know things combustion, things don't work correctly and it becomes unhealthy. So there's a learning curve, other negative things. There is an initial construction cost increase. Um, it should be offset in all forecasting we've seen of this by the savings long-term, but it's essentially you know, paying more upfront for a structure that costs less to operate over 30 or 50 or 100 years. Um, in theory, the, the savings should well outweigh the upfront initial construction cost, but that is something that needs to be said. It would drive up initial construction prices by a amount. Um, and then just the education period of getting people, um, not creating whiplash could be another negative of new standards applied um, are they done in a timely fashion? That's a political question. That's why it's in front of the council and it's not a staff decision just to adopt it or not. Um, there's a political component. How quickly do you want uh, contractors uh, or professionals in these uh, industries, mechanical industries, heating, HVAC, things like that, to have to change the standards? Do you want a different standard in Freeport um, than some of our neighboring towns? There would be two standards in Maine. There would be the current code and the, the stretch energy code. That's what they always are. So it's not like they're going to be 15 or 150 different standards like before MUBEC existed. 
there are two, there are always going to be two energy standards. In theory, the, the structure of the code should remain the same, but there may be new requirements in the stretch code that aren't in the previous energy code. So it is a political decision. Um, I think a lot of people have been talking to us and requesting that the town at least consider doing it, um, which is why it's in front of you here. So, Perfect. Thank you for that overview. That's helpful. Um, John, I know we've had some discussions around different ways of proceeding with this. Do you want to share some of that with what we might propose to the council on how to move forward? Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to remember all of them, but um, I, I guess I just want to start out with the, um, you know, the, the, the power of language that we're, we're using this term stretch like we are um, having to expect the participants, whether it's the building permit seekers, the home builders, the contractors, that they're, you know, having to make this enormous effort to meet what we may consider to be uh, uh, more energy efficient, at least on the uh, energy conservation code element, um, a, a significant reach. And it's the 2021 code. Uh, now, the state hasn't adopted it yet, but I guess it's, you know, almost 2023. It's hard for me to imagine how a 2021 uh, code is considered a real stretch. I guess my point is, really what we're doing here is adopting the latest energy code and the latest building code. And so I don't, I, I guess I just want to be careful of the energy and emotion behind the word stretch in that we're asking only our town to do something that nobody else is being asked to do when in fact it's going to be the 2021 <laughs> building code that is the next MUBEC code that is, that is adopted. Um, if we were talking about the 2028 proposed energy code with technology that is just emerging onto the marketplace, yeah, then I would say that's a stretch and we'd have to really talk about how we're going to um, educate our, our trades forces, our trades uh, sector, um, as well as our inspections and, and just bring, bring that whole thing into the market. But that's not where we are. So I guess I just want to point that out. Um, I think the uh, the pathway that we talked about, again, this sort of undermines my previous point about that's not really that far, is to um, have this consideration for um, availability and put a, a date a little bit out in the future in which this uh, would, would actually be adopted by, by the town. And I'm, that's a matter of months for me, not for years. Um, so that people can get used to it and that uh, the trade sector can uh, be aware that this is what the town is, is moving forward with. And then we can have some education, we can bring in some resources. There are plenty of uh, training modules about how to um, do the various assemblies that lead to the, the higher um, uh, air efficiency, air exchange efficiency, and, and um, tighter envelopes. So there's, there's lots of training that, can, that the town could actually be proactive in holding workshops about. We have a number of public spaces, and it's easy to get those people to come and do those workshops. Uh, it's harder to get people to come and attend those workshops. Um, so I think we have some opportunity here. And again, I, I think it's really in the course of what we do with all of our other uh, ordinances and regulations that are having to keep up with a state standard we're keeping up with a state standard. I don't think we're actually really reaching all that far. Um, and yet, the, uh, I, I don't think we should necessarily either um, uh, rest on the inefficiency of the overall state adoption. It was quite an effort in, I think it was 2012, was uh, it had been many, many years. I don't know if folks in the audience can probably correct me, but I think it was the, the 2012 MUBEC adoption across the state, maybe it was even before that, um, there was a, an enormous lag of the previous adoption. So that was a, a huge victory to get the state period on, on MUBEC in 2012, um, or somewhere, somewhere back there about 10 years ago or a little longer. 
Uh, and and it, it does take a long time, and there are lots of constituents, as Peter just talked about, and lots of processes to go through. But I think that um, that the the elements that are in the 2021 are small incremental elements of uh, better understanding. Um, building science is a rapidly emerging technology uh, sector, and we, we know a whole lot more about building science now than we did 10 years ago in terms of how to manage energy efficiency and, and indoor air quality. So I, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting that we um, spend much more effort on articulating what these actual changes are, have a little bit of time for people to sort of digest that and get to get used to it, and that we move forward with something uh, a little bit into calendar 23. That makes sense. Yep. And the one thing I'd add to that is I, I'd love to have some input from our new housing committee if we can get one together quickly enough. I don't want it to cause a delay in talking about this issue, but uh, I just want to make sure that we don't diminish the speed at which we're going to address our housing problem. Uh, and if these codes work in tandem with what we want to do in housing, then I think, great, all systems you know, go. Uh, but it'd be nice to have some input from the folks who are really thinking about the housing problem as well. Um, so uh, I'm hopeful to get that group together or use an existing group if, if that's what we decide to do and get them to weigh in as well. Uh, but other than that, I agree with everything that, that you said. Um, Council Fournier. I'm going to come out at a different angle. Um, one question I asked on the workshop when this was initially proposed, I think it was in February, what is the cost per square foot to add this code? I haven't got an answer yet, so I, I'm hoping to get the answer. Uh, number one. Number two, I think it is important that we have uh, the most efficient energy needs there, but I've also talked to people that are trying to build new homes that come out and they're saying, help me. I know we got savings down the road 20, 30, 40 years. I'm worrying about my 10 years that I don't lose the home. So we need to think a, a different approach that, uh, however, let me tell you this. When I built my home in 1974, the code required me to have eight inches of, of insulation in my attic. Well, as I'm heating throughout the winter months in, in Maine, I get a little bit of ice on the edge of the roof. No wonder. All the heat's going right up through the attic and melts in the snow and causing ice backup. After I added a significant amount of insulation, that problem was solved. So this, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, I, I, we all learn as we get a little wiser down the road. The, the other thing I, I, that concerns me a little bit is are we... We talked about whiplash coming in, and uh, you know we've heard pros and cons on whether Freeport's an easy place to build or not. Do we add another layer, uh, or or do we take the other approach where um, I think if people are educated coming up front saying, "Hey, have you ever thought about doing this? It's, it's above the code, but but here's the payback." Sometimes that approach is better than the stick, <laughs> and. Um, and, and then, you know, in our staff time, if we got to train the contractors in our staff time, which uh, I know we're, we're really lean on our code enforcement office, he's right out straight. And so those are just some of the discussions. I'm not opposed, but I want to hear two sides of the argument. Yeah, no, I, really good points, Daryl, because I think um, some of the things that are swimming around in my mind, too, are um, are there creative mechanisms we can uh, either find and encourage people to use or maybe stand up for ourselves to say, hey, you know what, I know you got to spend a lot up front, you're going to get it back over 20 years. Maybe we can help connect the dots on that and say, here's access to some financing that you can pay back over 20 years, but we'll, we'll front the money for the extra construction. Um, or maybe there's something we can do as a town. Um, and then the other thing, question I have in my mind is, is do we adopt these codes for everybody all at once or do we say look if you're building a big multifamily house you should really be doing it the right way or the newer better way but if you're building an adu or a garage or something small maybe we'd be a bit more lenient or give you a little bit more time um so there you know it doesn't have to be an all or none approach but but there are you know a variety of ways to to get to where we i think ultimately want to be in the end so or at least where i think we should be um, any other questions from the council before we invite the public? Councilor Bradley? 
Yeah, I just want to um, go back to something Daryl mentioned, and I think you, Dan, are thinking about, and that is uh, Nick. And I don't, this has been described as, as not too big a leap. I've had some people call me and say this is a huge and expensive leap and be careful about how you do it, and I don't know which is which. So, But what does Nick think? I mean, is he up to speed on this? Does he need training um, to to John Egan's point, if he does, should, we sure should give it to him before we make it effective. Um, so I don't know what any of those, uh, how, how you answer those kind of questions, but I, I would focus initially um, on on Nick, and it, I have no objection to doing this. I frankly think it's a great idea, um, even if it just distinguishes the town of Freeport in the climate discussion in, in the state and puts us in the vanguard of doing the right kinds of things. It's one thing that Freeport can has come forward with and support that, but let's do it in a way that uh, doesn't put Nick under more pressure or at least protects him um, or helps him get through this process if he needs it. I don't know whether he needs it or he doesn't. Do you have a comment? I mean, yeah, I do. Actually, we we had kind of met with some of the the uh, FCAN folks or folks involved with FCAN um, on that exact question. I think that was one of the questions that we were asked. I I have very few, and I think Nick has very few concerns about his ability to do it and to learn the new codes. I mean, codes change all the time. That's part of his job is is knowing them when they come up. He is not. Um, I think he was not at the time we talked up to the 2021 energy code only because he doesn't enforce it. He said when it's adopted, whether it's by the council or by MUBEC, he learns it pretty quickly what the changes are. They're not huge compared to some of the other leaps that have happened. But I do think the second part of what Ed brought up as a question was a concern of his was that he would be failing more people and for not meeting code. And is that that's that was what his concern was to the council. I think that he wanted emphasized was not his ability to do it. It takes the same amount of time. But as people learn, you know, what's what's backlash from that going to be? How many times, how many builders is he going to have to work with to say, no, you really need our blank, you know, whatever it is in the wall and the ceiling? Or that's not really the concern. Like, people know that the R codes change and things like that. It's where different technologies, not new, I guess, uh, as John aptly pointed out, they're not new technologies, but as new technologies are put into the building process that traditional builders who just have done it one way you know you've got people who are in the industry for 20 30 40 years and then to be like hey that way you've always built that structure that's no longer how you do it you do it this way but and that's not nick's job to train the in, to train the industry his job is to enforce the code i think it's our job if we're going to be adopting this mm -hmm. to put that information out there bring those trainer resources into our community invite the trades representatives to come and learn i don't I, I, I agree. I don't think we should be putting it on, on the code officer at all, uh, which is why I think we need a little bit of time to actually put it into place. But I, I think it's incumbent upon us to get proactive so that Nick doesn't have to be reactive. He would probably agree with that then. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how we would identify this question to Peter, but um, how many outside contractors do we have working in our community? Good question. We could do some research. Uh, I, think, I, I, I think it's a fair number, and and you know, serving on the ICC code committee that develop codes, yep. one plus side of the state doing it. The negative side, they're way behind. The plus side is they do the training, and guess and so I I I, I really like the idea of maybe there's a carrot here or something to come in. That boy could. To, to educate the people or whatever, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Try a different approach. Just think, you know, maybe thinking outside the box. I, I, I'm not sure all the time that, that people are comfortable when government is shoving stuff down the throat, <laughs> good or bad. So it is your idea then here's an incentive, here's the, the, the stretch code, and if you meet it, the town will offer you some money or something else? I go back, if somebody had educated me, so I did not have only eight inches of insulation in my home for about 12 years, the savings I had, uh, my payback was, yeah. was almost immediate, right. certainly. So that's a good example of where a little education, 
not enforcement, education to come down. Have you thought about this? Here's an opportunity that that I I probably would be all over. And I think a lot of people are. I I, I think as you know, and, and maybe this is more of an educational process. I I, I don't know. And uh, I think we need to move in that direction because I saw the benefits of it. All right. Any other council comments? We've got a number of people who are eager to talk, I think. Um, so we've got about eight or nine folks in the room. I'm guessing a lot of you want to want to speak. There's also f seven folks on Zoom. So why don't we go around the room first, give everybody in, in the room a chance to speak, uh, and then we'll go to the folks on Zoom uh, who can put their hand up, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call on you after we're done with the folks in the room. So anybody in the room wants to step up to the podium, tell us who you are, uh, and try and keep your comments to, uh, to, to three minutes or less, if you would, just because we've got a lot of folks to get through. But yeah, step on up to the podium, please. Three-minute timer. Do you want to run one? My name is Lance Fletcher. I live in Freeport for the last almost 50 years. And uh, when I moved here, I was an architect for 30 years. When I moved here, standard building practice was two by fours, no insulation. You remember that. Uh, it was extra. I really <laughs> wanted some insulation. Over the course of my practice for 30 years, things changed. They changed regularly, and they changed in part because of codes and because people learned and because, as John mentioned, building science is constantly changing and learning more. And um, it, it, I, I know builders around Freeport, I know builders in the area who have been doing this stuff to, that would meet the 2021 code. They know how to do it, and if they don't know how to do it, the, the opportunities to learn it, something like blower door testing, for example, are right there. They're all over the place these days. Um, builders who want to practice in build in Portland, South Portland, and I am told Cumberland, which has already trained its code enforcement officer in the stretch code, um, will have to know those things. And I just would like to address a, a couple, some of the cons. There is an increased initial cost. According to the Department of Energy's studies and other studies, that cost will be less than, in most cases, well less than 1% of the cost of the building. Uh, we all know a 1,200-foot cape and a 4,000-square-foot uh, house on the water are going to have all sorts of different costs. But the fact is, all, all of the projections that we got, uh, that the DOE is dealing with, have less than a percent. The 2021 IECC code over the 2015 was a quantum leap in terms of savings and efficiency, 10 percent savings, which begin the first year. So you're not waiting. You're getting, you're getting that savings. And as energy prices go up, the savings go up. Um, decreased building quality and resident comfort if improperly constructed, which is true for every building. Uh, if you get a competent contractor and you do a little bit of research with that contractor and about that contractor, you can find out a whole lot before they ever put hammer to nail. And, and if you want a contractor who's going to meet the code, you do a little bit of research before you hire them. I think most people, given what building costs these days, do that research. Um, <laughs> and the adjustment period, as I said, people, the, the professional builders that I know and have worked with for 30 years, uh, know how to get educated on things that are changing and on building science. I think it's a great idea if the town of Freeport wanted to offer some help to some of the smaller builders. The, build, the big ones are going to be working in Portland. They know this stuff. Thank you. That was the sound of our three-minute timer for those in the audience, yes. if you hear that sound. <laughs> yes. wasn't your phone ringing. Don't worry. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
I think Mason was afraid. Oh, yeah. My name is Naomi Beal. I live on South Freeport Road. I'm um, the executive director of Passive House Maine, which is an organization that promotes low carbon, high performance construction. I also have um, sat on the Maine uh, Code Collaborative, which is sort of a casual group that's been meeting before the adoption of the 20. 15 and 2021 codes, and I sit on the um, Energy Code Technical Assistant Group up in Augusta. Um, and so I just wanted to answer a couple of things that came up in um, the discussion on the council. Um, a really important point is that the Maine State Housing Authority has already adopted the stretch code. So any of the multifamily buildings that we're talking about that are funded through Maine State Housing Authority are already meeting this code. They meet the code not just here in Freeport, but across the state. That is um, a really wonderful step made by uh, our state uh, housing authority. Um, I, the idea of the upfront cost, you know, as um, we've just heard, it's pretty incremental, but also um, building a high performance building with beneficial electrification, you know, leaning on the electric system, also then can meet um, a bunch of electric incentives that are prioritized at Efficiency Maine. So there's a whole suite of um, appliances that would be a lot cheaper. Um, it might even out, there might be a way of um, sort of meeting those upfront costs. However, I also love the idea of working on some kind of financing that might help meet uh, for homeowners to uh, meet those upfront challenges. Um, training the um, CEO here, Nick, as a code enforcement officer. Good news, Passive House Maine does have trainings right now. Um, building to code through Passive House principles. We have builders who, in our membership um, and in our directory that will um, have been working in this way for more than a decade. We've developed trainings that really help demystify and make accessible some of the more perceived to be complicated um, elements. And they are complicated. Some things are complicated, but they're strategies and materials to be used. Um, I loved Ed's comment about leadership by Freeport. Just really taking a stand and saying, you know what, here in Freeport, we understand that um, quality housing for our people, quality commercial spaces um, on our main street are um, an important part. Oh my gosh, <laughs> outside contractors. Yes, I think that most uh, contractors commercial contractors, many commercial contractors are already up to speed. And I did just want to make an appeal about the commercial buildings. It's not just single family homes. We have, we build a lot and um, all of those buildings should be at the highest standard possible. Thank could I Thanks, ask sir. a question yeah. just, Naomi, could I ask you a question? Because I know that you're very up to speed on where the state stands. We talked sure. about it when we met before. Yeah. I'd, I'd mentioned that maybe sometime in the next six months, what what do you think the current, as someone who deals with this know, weekly, what's, what's your current to, estimate? I reached out to Paul Demer, who is yep. um, sort of managing that process at the state level. I think that was just yesterday, right? I just said, what do you think the latest is? I mean, I, there he's not making any promises at all. I would love to see that that 2021 is adopted as a base code sooner rather than later, but I think we'd be lucky if it was done before March, to be honest. But it, he wouldn't make any promises. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, who wants to go next? We got time. Anyone? Sure. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> we won't bite. Bob Stevens, 50 Moose Crossing, Freeport. Many years at uh, Porter's Landing. Um, first, uh, I want to uh, compliment Peter on his excellent presentation. 
of the information on this code. You have been studying, Mr. City Manager. You, you really covered a lot. With glad a lot I've of got some. I'm glad I've got the audience on my side. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> It's not an unusual thing. Um, and, yeah, and, and the comments, I think, uh, really good about uh, the future and what we would like Freeport to be. And I think Daryl makes some really, you know, good points that, that need to be looked at here, too. Cost, and I hope that some of the answers um, here will help on that. Uh, as far as payback, I think that may help, uh, hopefully, too. Um, and I guess there's always a learning curve. I'm thinking, you know, any regulation comes along, can be looked at. Here's something that we got to do, but usually to make something better, you know, like an eight-hour work uh, day instead of a 12-hour work day and other things. And I think that's the way we have to look at building codes as well. It's uh, their pluses. They require work, but they have great benefits. I don't think it will uh, prevent anything happening in Freeport that otherwise is going to happen as far as building. I think Freeport is such an attractive location for both business and residences that people expect it to be done right here and they're going to come here and this will become a selling point, I believe. So I think it's more of a positive than we might think. And also, if, if like 40 percent of the uh, of how the energy uh, gets lost, I, the way I understand this, is is in um, in buildings. That's where a lot of our fossil fuel goes. And you look at where that is in the state. You know, a lot of it is here in southern southern Maine. So now, if we get Portland, South Portland, Cumberland, Freeport. Who's next in this area? We can make some real changes more than a lot of other smaller communities out further, even those they may be over 4,000 population. There's, so here's a chance to have a real effect. Um, the other on housing, I really think this could be a plus for affordable housing because um, Lance mentioned, maybe others have, the increase of energy costs, and they're going to go up. So anything we can do at the front end, I'll make it fast, I'll try to make it fast, to bring down the cost, I think it's going to pay dividends in the future. So I think it might, you, if the council is looking at housing, affordable housing, this may fit right into that, frankly, as, as a plus. Um, just last bit. Uh, this is local. We can do something local, and let's do it. Thanks. That's better. Thank you. Well said. Anybody else in the room? Got a few folks we haven't heard from. Anybody else want to speak? Um, when, while you're thinking about that, if you're on Zoom and you want to speak, raise your hand. Use the raise hand feature in Zoom. So we do have one. We'll Good. go John. to Zoom. Who do we have up? John O'Brien. Hi, John. Hey, can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. All right, you can't see me, but you can see my uh, first initial, so that's important. Um, I, we're new here. Uh, we moved from Upper Michigan, where they, they don't have um, nearly the, the building standards that we do here in Maine. Um, that, that green uh, uh, sheathing that you see, that zip system, nobody's heard of that in, in Upper Michigan. And it's cold there in the winters. Um, so I guess my point is that, you know, we're already really close to this. And it's just, it's just a baby step in my mind um, to get us to this next level. And it's coming anyway, um, you know, as soon as March potentially. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, to enact this is um, it sets Freeport apart. It, it uh, you know, shows that we care, that we're doing our part. Um, and so I don't think it's a heavy lift. Uh, and then I wanted to make a point about, um, you know, when, when a builder goes and 
he's maybe it's a little different than what they're used to. I think that it, you know, when they turn in that um, the application for the building permit, and they've got their plans, and you know, there's that initial point of contact. Uh, it, it wouldn't be hard to supply them with um, like a handout that that goes over those yep. the changes from what it was before. I think you know it's and, and probably Freeport can could help supply that or Passive House Maine. So just just a comment there. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate yep. that. Had a minute left on your timer, so well done. Okay, we also have Kara, who I'll bring over right now. Hi, Kara, you can go ahead. Great, uh, thank you so much. My name is Kara Patiemner. I live on Wolf's Neck. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, building energy codes are really important because they address a market failure. So while, you know, if you are an attentive, you know, educated owner, you're building a new building and you're working with the the architect and the, the builder, you know, you can request these new uh, energy efficient technologies, but often a builder will build the building and then you sell it to someone or you have someone um, who buys it and then you rent it to someone else. And ultimately it's the owner or the renter that's paying those energy bills. And so there's this split incentive that the builder wants to market something that has an attractive cost, lower cost, but they're not taking into account the full cost that the, the homeowner or renter needs to pay over um, the life of the building. And so um, by establishing building energy codes, you're sort of making the market, you're, you're doing what's right for, for those residents by lowering their total costs, by making their energy more affordable and, and predictable, um, but solving this market barrier. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that uh, piece. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Right. Uh, anyone else in the room or on Zoom who wants to talk about this? Oh, is there a question in the chat? Oh, we have. Can you pull up your Q&A in the bottom? That's there? not supposed to be enabled. Yeah, I didn't think it was. Uh, it was oh. from Kara. Ooh, it's from Kara. It sounds like um, is it what she discovered. Very close to what, she's, what she just said. So. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Sorry, I should have. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie, Carrie typed in. I okay. wasn't sure if she could speak, so she put most of her comments in the chat. Um, just uh, sorry, that should be disabled. Everyone in the audience, we don't. Although I can see the red bubble here, and it's more visible to people in the audience where it's big on the screen, apparently. So um, just uh, be careful if you type in the chat. We might not see it. Raise your hand for sure. We'll see that. Any other comments? I have to speak for another person. All right, we can do that. <laughs> But I promised uh, Lear Engel, who lives uh, off of Litchfield Road and has been working with Freeport Can for a while. She couldn't be here tonight, and she has written a letter to the council, and um, basically she's pointing out what we're all facing in the world, and here's a chance to do something a little something here at our local level to do something about it. And uh, rather than read the entire letter, I'd like to present it and have it be included in the record, if I may. Sure. Happy to do that. And I guess the other one item would be... Sure. I'll yeah, make sure, sure you guys get copies of this. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe speaking for other people in Cannes, there were hundreds of people, of course, who signed the petition to the council asking you to take a look at this. And uh, on their behalf, I want to thank you for doing it. This is important, and we want to continue to help in any way we can the town do what we can. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, there's nothing else. Oh, Councilor Bradley, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> something, Dan, you said, um, I've been thinking about as people spoke, and I guess the question is, if this is a priority for the community, and I think it should be, um, is there any way that the town can address the uh, expense of 
increased expense of it um, by through property tax or any TIFs, any any mechanisms that we have, or we, or would we be willing uh, to put the town behind um, the effort fiscally? Yeah, I mean, it's a question for all seven of us. I, I, I'm keen to explore it. I'm keen to explore what state programs are available. I know there's, uh, I don't know the details, but I know there were there loan programs for energy improvements and things like that, and some, some rebates as well. Um, I know other towns have dipped into their own coffers to do some limited uh, incentives as well. So I, I don't have the answer, but I'm certainly interested in looking into it and seeing what, what comes up. Um, but I'd be very cautious about you know what, how we spend taxpayer money for sure. Daryl, you want to add? And I don't know, maybe Peter could check. I, I really thank you for that 1%. That, that helps me a lot. And uh, wouldn't it be nice maybe thinking outside the box, but a, uh, uh, a sunset where a new home co owner comes in and they save 1% of taxes on the valuation of the house that would be sunsetted out at maybe four years. You know, something that, that would not affect us forever, but that sunsetting proposal would help them maybe get that little over the hump for people that are struggling. Then their savings are going to kick in and after a three or four year period, it would come back and, and we would get the full compliment back here. That, I, I think that would be a great something to look at. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure we can't reduce somebody's taxes, but we can offer them a credit equivalent to 1% of their taxes. We're limited to charging everybody the same rate and, and right. tax by, by law. But, yeah, but I get the spirit of what you're trying to say for sure. Yeah, that's right. that's correct. You can appropriate money if you think it's a public interest to do so. The council can make right. that decision that we have to send on our assessing and tax collection and that the assessor and I have to collect a uniform amount, but you could offer it like as a credit or something. It would right, kind right. of be how it would right. be viewed. Yeah. 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 Okay. Super. All right. So then if it's all right, I'm ready to move on. We've got two more things we still need to discuss tonight. Um, so. I think we've got a lot to, to think about, um, certainly some things to explore, some work to do, um, and then hopefully before long we can come back with some, some ideas and proposals. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for all of you bringing this forward and making this a priority for us. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. And I appreciate all the, the emails we've gotten as well. So thank you and stay tuned. See what we can do. Um, all right. With that, um, we have some um, discussion around Freeport Community Services and the work they've been doing for us, which is uh, valuable and increasing every day. <laughs> uh, so on that note, um, did you want to introduce yeah. the conversation? I think yeah. you've been a little bit closer to the, to the topic. But. I'd be glad to, Mr. Chair. I know um, probably some new information for, for a lot of the counselors. Some... We had originally talked about <clears throat> several times now, but the council hasn't made a formal decision on it, but we had originally talked about the remaining ARPA funds. Um, by the way, for the record, that's approximately 750000 I think it's like seven fifty two okay. and some change. Sorry to interrupt. Mason, Mason, you don't want to leave without your phone. I'll be don't back. forget. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Call me anytime. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, think, I, think he's, I think he can hear us through it. So um, the... Uh, Sorry, we have about $752,000 and some change remaining in that pot, which has not been used for anything other than what the council voted on. can't be used for anything other than what the council already accepted um, in the budget and also the staffing, um, the, I want to call it, hazard, it's not hazard pay, it's uh, premium pay. Sorry, thank you. Not supposed to use the word hazard pay, we're told. Um, under ARPA, because it doesn't, it's not a qualifier. Um, so... Anyways, th that money exists. We had talked about splitting that money into three different pots of money. I know the council hadn't made a formal action on that, one being uh, a contribution to Freeport Community Services, a grant, if you will, and that amount, um, sorry, and that, that grant would support, if you remember, one of the, the key purposes of ARPA was to, the intents of ARPA was to offset impacts to people uh, lower income in our community, people who were impacted by COVID or, or now um, being impacted by energy costs and 
additional things that are, you know, the state of the economy as we go through the winter. We are anticipating that that's going to be pretty significant. Um, I don't think you've seen a massive influx of uh, heating assistance yet, but we're probably expecting it to be one of the worst. We've, we've had a really good run of the past six or seven years when both FCS and the town were doing heating assistance programs. I think you're a little bit nervous right now, Sarah, about what you're expecting to see for GA application, general assistance applications, just because of the heating and also heating assistance separate from GA. Um, people who don't qualify for GA, but I'm looking at my oil tank and trying to figure out where $1,500, when $1,500 is going to be a good payment for, you know, a 350-gallon oil tank to get filled. I'm not looking forward to that, and I'm not in need. I mean, there are people that it's going to make cold this winter. So um, that's one of our concerns. I know that um, when we first started also, so we're expecting a lot of GA increases over the coming years. You're seeing some GA, GA increases, not to that extent right now. Um, and I know that when we started the program, um, we were hopeful that and I think you, you folks agree that this is kind of what you were seeing for the beginning of having FCS outsource our GA program. We thought 10, to 10 hours a month would be kind of the what we were expecting to see. And Mike is probably going upwards of 20 to 30 now, closer to 30 hours a month. Do you, if you want to comment. Yeah, I would say he's closer to like 50 to 60, okay. if not higher. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Not great, but, it's, but thank you for the clarification. Right, um, right. So... So we've had some preliminary conversations with FCS about do they need additional help in the interim to do this. Um, there's a few different um, things that are driving that. I uh, think we should mention that. So we've got um, hotels on Route 1 South that are being extensively used for both homeless uh, shelter placements, homeless shelter alternative placements, some um, because there are not enough shelter space available. We also have uh, refugee and asylum seeker families that are placed there. I want to be very clear about that. We are not paying those rents to the hotels. Um, those are being covered by, I want to say, Merck, rental assistance. emergency rental assistance yeah. programs, um, Merck, Maine Immigrants Right Coalition, and the City Prosperity of Portland. Maine too. And Prosperity, yeah. yep. And, and the City of Portland is also covering some that's getting less as time goes on for Correct. original families that they had originally placed the rental and food portions of those are being covered by those agencies there are still additional food costs and non-food like medical type things yeah. that mike is helping which is much smaller than the amount that rent would be but it still doesn't help the dollar amount is smaller but the time commitment is much more because right. they you still meet, have to do the same application whether or not it's for rent or for food on a monthly basis Correct. and mike's following out them and requalifying. Mike, by the way, is Mike Tausek, who's our GA administrator who works at FCS. So there's an additional workload from all of those things, um, and even people who don't qualify for general assistance who um, who apply on a regular basis. He still has to go through, spends half an hour to an hour meeting with them, right. qualifying them, seeing just to say, hey, you don't qualify, but hey, there are other programs maybe that FCS can help with um, that aren't GA. Right. Some, so that, some resources require a denial from general assistance correct. before they'll step in. So there's so so the workload we are seeing what I would I I don't want to say temporary. I think it's temporary in the fact that we don't think it's permanent. Mm -hmm. But I think of temporary as being three months or six months. Right. I think that this is a situation that FCS is seeing to continue for a year, maybe two years. Um, I would say at least a year. With kind of what's what we're expecting the long term um, housing climate in Maine is not getting better and there are not alternatives. There aren't shelter alternatives that are being developed in the pipeline, which is a whole no. another major policy failure that we won't get into tonight. That's way above our heads at yes. the state level. Um, yes. But I'll stop right there. Um, you guys are picking up the brunt of that now at Freeport Community Services. Correct. Freeport, uh, problems that were, and I don't wanna, this is not a Portland bashing session because the city of Portland went way out of their way over what they were legally bound to do for many 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 years right. as we've talked about earlier this year portland cut back to what they're legally required to do in many instances and that problem then spreads throughout the region mm -hmm. um so i would say we're probably we may be a little more exposed than some of the other communities around us because of our hotel per capita you know mm -hmm. in terms of hotel rooms per capita but it's a cost that was being borne by 
somebody else, mainly the state and the city of Portland for many, many years until now. Right. So we may be disproportionate compared to like a Yarmouth or a Cumberland right. who don't have hotel rooms, but we're not disproportionate, you know, in the grand scheme of things. So mm -hmm. those are but some of the factors that are influencing what's happening at FCS. So Sarah came and talked to us, gave us a little bit of information, and the answer was, well, there was a conversation many months ago with the council. Let's bring it back to the council to get a temperature check from are we ready to go forward, move forward with that? Do we want more information? And that helps you make some decisions about what you need to do. Right. I don't think we're planning on asking for anything to be voted on tonight, but if the council is favorable, please direct us when you'd like right. to do that. Um, so, so I think where we are for tonight is, you know, as Peter mentioned, we had this discussion however many months ago to say of the ARPA funds remaining, uh, we have three big buckets that we, we had said we wanted to spend it on. Uh, one was for downtown related projects, which are still TBD, and we've had a discussion about that earlier. Um, another bucket for infrastructure related projects, which is also TBD. Uh, and then we had uh, the third bucket was Freeport Community Services that we had general consensus. Yes, that's a, a worthy thing to spend some of this money on. Um, and at the time, the question was, well, what would they do with it? Um, and that was, I think, some of the discussion that, that Matt might have had with FCS. And, and uh, we pursued that, and now we have an answer. And it seems like there's not only there's detail available on what they would do with it, but there's also a pressing need for uh, for more services uh, for them to be able to offer on our behalf. So what we're looking for tonight is just confirmation of that consensus that, yep, that's still an appropriate thing to pursue. If we get that, I expect we'd come back, hopefully as soon as the next meeting, honestly, because you, you're kind of waiting on us to put an offer out, to start programs, to start helping people. Yeah. Um, so that we'd come back to the next meeting with a specific dollar amount and saying this is what we want to appropriate, and that's when we would take a vote to appropriate it. Um, so if the answer is kind of a, gosh, no, we don't want to do that, um, we need to let Sarah know that as soon as possible. But if the answer is, you know, yeah, we still think that's generally a good idea, come back to us with the details, then that, that's what we're looking for tonight. 752 is roughly the balance that we Correct. have to work from. Well, did we? we didn't allocate more in the budget process than we thought. So I thought the 752 was what was left from the entire pool less the uh, pay for first responders. We, I think, I think there's, I think there's less. Than I think that. we appropriated fifty thousand in the budget process to come out of ARPA, right? It and was more than than what we thought mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that number just needs to be revised. Yep. yep. Um, well, I just got that number this afternoon from Jessica. Uh, if she doesn't have that fifty in the seven fifty two number, then assume. Well, I mean, we'll we'll make sure that that's correct before we have any final recommendations but then assume for worst case that it's 700 flat i think i think the original was like 900 something mm -hmm. and i think the, the public safety premium pay was netted out before we got to the 750 something that we were talking about but i i think yeah i'm not sure where because we did put a little bit in there for mm -hmm. mitigation on the tax yeah. on the tax mill yeah, there's 50 i think mm -hmm. budgetary items that yeah. were approved by the council so if that's correct, if 752 is before the budget, we're at 700,000 right yeah. now. So yeah. and we're not saying three equal buckets. We're saying the right. three general buckets. Yeah, Darren. So. Sarah, I, I have a question. So I know uh, heating oil is huge. Now, uh, are you able to do K1 or, or, or even people that burn wood? Are you yes. So you can, as far as heating, you can supply any number of remedies correct any kind that people use k1 is a bit of a struggle right now to secure there's there seems to be um a, a less of a supply of k, of that right now okay. so we're we're struggling with that and just like the the length of time that it's going to take for folks to have that put in their tank um but we are able to do pellets wood okay. um propane okay k1 and okay. regular fuel oil. so uh well that said uh What's your number? What, what do you think? And I don't, you know, a realistic number because I think it's going to hit people. It's coming quickly, and you know. 
Yeah, I mean, so much of it does depend on other resources within the community. Um, we have a fair amount of money just kind of reserved for Kaplan Fuel. We had a really robust freeze out this past year. Um, and But that is not going, at this current rate, it will not be enough to cover 40 people, um, 40 households. So we're really concerned about that. Um, last year we did 87. You did eight last year? Yes. In yeah. Mile winter. Right. And, and we've already gotten, I know poor Mike was working over the weekend and up until I think the council meeting started um, processing Kaplan applications, our fuel fund applications. So what, uh, what have you, you said 40, is that what you've seen already for applications or is it more? I don't than think that? we're at 40 at this point, but I think we're close to 20. Yeah. That's high. It's high. Yeah. Yeah, Matt. Um, can you just tell us a little bit just to help me wrap my head around it? Uh, how do we leverage state funding through like LIHEAP and things like that? Yeah. And how does that process flow uh, start to finish and when do you, you guys jump in? Right, right. So HEAP actually, we're partnering with Opportunity Alliance. That's a cap agency that administers HEAP for our area. They're coming twice, I think once this month and then again in December um, to do open blitz days at FCS, which will advertise. That means you don't have to wait for an appointment. Traditionally with HEAP, you have to call them. They'll send you a postcard with an appointment and it can take quite some time. Um, so, so we're working toward, we're collaborating really closely with them to make sure there's opportunities to be seen and have applications taken. And even, even if someone were to get their application in, you know, I've, I've had calls from people that have gotten them, them in, have, have processed their application August, September. They're still not saying, like, until December, until funds will be released. And that kind of depends on the federal government on, on when that's released. So, you know, part of the, the hope and the goal of our Kaplan Fuel Fund, as well as the, the, the town fund and general assistance, as well, is that, you know, HEAP would be used first, and then we would be the backup plan. But because of the reality and how long it takes for things to process, we are often the gap um, filler in between the cold season starting and then these resources coming through. And I, I don't really know what to anticipate for allocations or an average allocation from HEAP at this point. So it, it may not, you know, given the price, it may not be sufficient to put 100 gallons in a person's tank for the whole season. So I think uh, when you say you're the gap, so it, is it like 100 gallons of oil or is it a month's worth of wood or pellets or, or I right. guess? Yeah, so we'll do 100 gallons of oil. We'll do um, a pallet of, of um, pellets and then a quart of wood. Um, if it's a propane tank because it is somewhat dangerous not to fill it, we'll just fill it. So depending on the size of that, it can dramatically, you know, fluctuate the, the end cost of, of it. And we are coming, I just got to put in a plug, we're coming into our super busy season with the holidays. And that's really kind of what prompted, I was reflecting and talking with Peter and, and Dan a bit about just how with the holiday helpline that we do and the Thanksgiving meals, it's an incredibly busy time at the center. And so that, you know, we are feeling a, a sense of urgency or a real need to have an alternative in place. We feel very passionate about keeping it at FCS. It seems to be working really well. Again, we can wrap folks who may be denied from GA with a lot of really other supportive resources that they may not have gone down the hill to access. Joanna and I used to talk about that all the time. Like I'm sending someone down and I would never see them. Um, so we're really able to it's capture true. them and make sure that folks are, are aware of other resources and, and certainly utilizing whatever's out there. And yeah. <laughs> That's my plug. Yeah. I just put in a plug. I think this is not a, oh, my God, last minute thing. Um, I think right. you commented to me in June or even May, like, hey, the rate of what we're seeing for GA applications is really high. Right. It's way higher than what we anticipated when we did this agreement last year. And I said, yep, you're right. It's temporary, right? And so I said, oh, yeah, it's got to, it's, <laughs> we're 100%, the, the economy is going to go back and everything will be fine. And let's just ride it out and see what happens. And then. You know, August, you're like, optimist. I'm like, so everything work out? No, no, it's worse. And then right. <laughs> September, you're like, we really got a problem. Let's talk right. about it. So it's, this is not a uh, last minute surprise right. that's been sprung on us. They've been communicating with us, like, let's just wait and see. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it gets better. And we've kind of had that agreement. And then with the understanding that if things didn't get better, that we would right. approach the council with, yeah. to bring this problem forward. So it's not, it's, this is not a surprise, but it, 
maybe to the public to hear it that it's just yeah. so sudden, you know. Yeah. Oh, you, you got a no, question? Go ahead. I, I, one of the questions is Durham and Pownall are helping. Well, no, because the it's the, the the folks that we're helping with general assistance specifically. Okay. Um, that's that's obviously coming out of the Freeport budget. Um, however, we do get support from the town of Pownall um, annually. We don't with Durham. Um, that is something that I would love to change. I'd love to have Durham be a part of FCS and what we do. Um, I think there's there's a really strong argument for doing that, and that's certainly one of my projects. So let me ask a tough question. So uh, we, we give $50,000 towards uh, to address the heating concern with that. Mm -hmm. Some of that money could go to Durham people, correct? No, we don't serve Durham. None at all Currently. in Durham. So it would right. be mostly Powell or... Right. Oh, I okay. do let Durham folks sneak into our food pantry, but we've got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> oh, so I, the question, if they give to me, if ta if this money correct. comes out, it will be primarily for Freeport yes. residents and the ones you already. Okay, thank yeah, you. And, and when we look at our stats, I mean, I think last year, 13 of the households that we served were from Pownall, so it is substantially less. Yeah. Um, and you know the resources resources are, are a lot less in Pownall as well. Pownall does contribute something to the operation they do. as well. Yes, so. they sure do. They should get credit for that. Not on the same level as Freeport, but right. way to go Pownall. We like them. They they do they do participate, which we should thank them for. Yes. And yeah, Matt. I, I well, if you have questions, go ahead. I'm just going to give you my opinion where I stand. Um, if we're, I mean, when we talked about this earlier, I was supportive of a third, a third, a third. If we need more for this, I'd rather take it out of the infrastructure portion and allocate more of the funds to FCS. I mean, this goes exactly to what the funds were intended for, is to help our most vulnerable residents. Um, and, you know, I would like to see some of the funding help spur the development of the visioning, which I think is really important to our town long term. But this is a crisis, and, you know, whatever we have to do to get through it, I think, is really important. So that's where I stand. Uh, that's helpful. Agree with him. Right. Anybody else? Uh, Ed, I think you got a hand up. Yeah, I'm obviously very supportive of, of the request. I'm a little bit, um, and I'm also very supportive of what um, Matt said about supporting the revisioning with some of this funding, whether it's in the sewer project or whatever other project we prioritize. What, what causes me a little bit of caution here is that while this has been a <clears throat> conceptually a very uh, powerful presentation, it, it hasn't been quantified, um, for, to my mind, um, very well. And so, again, that may be a criticism, it may not be. It just seems to me that we ought to be able, in deciding what percentage of the remaining ARPA funds, to have some uh, realistic projection about how much is going to be needed. And if it's all of it, it's all of it. You know, if it's uh, 25 percent of it, 25 percent of it. I'm mindful that FCS has gotten money from a variety of sources through the pandemic, and that's that's great. But um, I think it's our job as counselors to sort of balance what the needs are community-wide and not to be um, responding to the one proposal at a time. So if you could, if if FCS is in a position to quantify this. More particularly, uh, that would help me um, have input into what percentage of the funds we should be allocating to FCS as opposed to the other um, buckets that we've identified. We could, yeah, we could put something together and For bring sure. it. I know the only hard numbers that we've talked with 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 Sarah and with Mike were um, the approximate twenty thousand range, maybe twenty four thousand range. The difference between what we're currently paying, right for Mike's time versus the time that you think you need for general assistance. So we, the contract with FCS currently is $12,000 a year. Mm -hmm. and, and we were thinking your estimate is a 30 hour position in the 30 plus Six, range. Right. Yeah. So the difference, so it's called 24,000 right. for two years, possibly for mm -hmm. being, you know, having this kind of period where we think we're going to be in some trouble with folks needing to apply and some new programs you might do with that money. That's fifty thousand, and then that's the only thing we quantified. I think we were thinking the rest would be an amount for heating assistance or. 
I rent think, assistance I or something met, like that. I think I sent you some capital expenses too that we were projecting um, for the next few years as well, just for upcoming. We could. Capital expenses for FCS? Correct. I mean, the presentation that's appealed to me, frankly, is that it, it helps the needy people directly, the people who are going to be cold, people who are going to be hungry. Uh, if it's if it's capital expenses for FCS, I don't oppose it, but then it ought to be presented in a in a very clear, uh, separate way. Same thing with the salary thing. I I guess I'm looking for a budget. That's all. And then sure. then I feel more comfortable making the allocation decisions personally. I don't know how others feel. Yeah, I can absolutely do that. And certainly, I, I don't. I'm trying to recall our conversation earlier. I know I had sent you something. I don't know if I had broken down anticipated heating assistance costs or those sort of things because it's been a while. I don't think you had because this was like in May. Right. And so. Right. The need, I mean, the economy was in a different place. For sure. Um, and there was just no way to project it. And I think now is a good time to look at that. Absolutely. Yeah. It was going to be a two week energy spike in May, right? When this all happened. And, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. On my uh, early support, I'm not mm -hmm. sure <clears throat> I would be supporting capital investment. Sure, I think absolutely. we have a process down there. What I'm looking for is the immediate need of staffing yeah. to, to address that, and I would be looking at a, I'm not comfortable with a two-year, me personally. Sure. I would be looking at maybe at a you know 12-month period, mm -hmm. and, then, and, and certainly the shortage of fuel assistance for the people. Those are the two things I'm focusing on. If, absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think right. that's very fair. And again, when we were having the conversation earlier, it was it was a much different conversation. Yeah. And I, I do want to emphasize, I think that if this continues as a permanent need, we would renegotiate what our arrangement is for Correct. GA mm -hmm. in recognition of that. That had always been the, the intent if right. things got crazy. But where we're seeing this maybe as a longer term temporary problem, we're hoping that we may not need to increase. I mean, I would hate to increase the contract to 30 hours and then you know, a week or, or 60 hours a month or whatever it is, and right. then get, you know, a year or two into this and be like, hey, so how's that person going? You're like, yeah, they're uh, they're out doing something else because right. we don't need it because right. that yeah. would be great if that if that need wasn't there. I would love it. Sure. So maybe yeah. we adjust it in budget years going forward if it's a permanent thing, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a stopgap for the immediate probably year right. to follow ensuing year. Anybody else want to weigh in? Public. Anybody from the public? Yeah, go on. Trade spots. <clears throat> Bob Stevens again, still living in Freeport. <laughs> um, I think this is a great use of, of some of the APRA money. What's really troubling about it is that it's a Band-Aid. And it's a Band-Aid that we're going to have to continue to apply until we figure out how to stop the bleeding and bring costs of heating and electricity under control. And so um, let's not lose sight of that. And in fact, we're talking about coming back to you again <laughs> with uh, the idea, again, South Portland has done something with some of their APRA money, is to provide some uh, uh, rebates, some assistance for weatherization and uh, uh, heat pumps, water heating, to people that are in a low and moderate income level. We're thinking about, well, how could Freeport manage to administer a program like this we don't have staff available for it. And someone thought FCS might be a great entity to work with and administer this kind of program. So we hope that we're going to be able to have some conversations about we're this. On Thursday. All right, good. <laughs> and may come back and say, hey, how about using 150,000 of that towards something that will not just be a, ba a band aid, but might sort of to help alleviate the need for band-aids. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I think what we've got so far is we've got general consensus that, yeah, it's appropriate to spend some of the ARPA money. We're waiting to hear back on some more details. The budget can include some, I don't want to say mandatory and optional, but, you know, really 
emergency things that you need right away and some other things that would be uh, be nice to have. Um, but if you could do that by next meeting, hopefully we can take a vote at the next Absolutely. meeting and get the I'll money. I'll get it to you by the end of the week. Perfect. Perfect, and we'll share it when we get it. Um, awesome. Thank you, Sarah, for coming in tonight and for all the work that you and your staff do, and please pass it on to Mike and, and everyone else for all the hard work I know they've been doing over the last year. Workers, for sure. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. guys. Um, and Sarah's offered to talk to any of us individually, too, if you have more questions or more detail. So thank you for that. You know where to find me. I'm just on the hill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sarah, is it best for phone or email to catch you during the day? Email would be lovely, but I'll never refuse a phone call. Okay. So and your email, your email is just? S. Lundin, so S-L-U-N-D-I-N at fcsmaine.org. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thanks again, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. We are down to our last item for tonight. Uh, and pretty close to our scheduled time. Uh, and I think this one will be relatively quick. So it's about mountain bike trails on Hedgehog Mountain. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick recap and then I'll explain what, uh, why I put it back in the agenda for tonight. So uh, a little over a year ago now, I think it was last summer, uh, Tawny and I think Peter started some conversations with the New England Mountain Bike Association, which we call NEMBA. Um, who had expressed an interest in funding, privately funding, some mountain bike trails that they would construct or, or hire to be constructed at Hedgehog Mountain. Hedgehog Mountain being the best place in town because we've got the most elevation there. Uh, so they had an initial proposal and some refinements. Um, it took a while to get in front of the Conservation Commission, who we task uh, as a town with managing the Hedgehog Mountain property. Uh, they in turn have a, a management plan that they publish and we approve uh, on how the property should be managed. That plan was out of date, um, but it did reference mountain bike trails. Uh, so they started the process of updating that. They, as part of that, they wanted to, to study the basically flora, fauna, environment of the property, especially at the summit, but all over. In order to do that properly, they said they wanted to be able to observe it in four different seasons. So they said they'd like to take until uh, this December to do that observation and then come up with the, the environmental part of that plan. Um, so while all that's been going on, uh, we've been encouraging everybody involved to keep on talking and saying, well, don't sit around and just wait for the environmental part of the plan to be right. done before you continue the conversation. So um, maybe a month or so ago, um, I called a meeting with uh, Jake was there, Peter was there, Nemba was there, the Conservation Commission was there, Freeport Conservation Trust was there, and we all just had an open discussion about, you know, what do we like, what are the trouble spots, uh, how can we move the thing forward, does it make sense to move it forward? General consensus, uh, I think, I hope I'm not speaking out of school, was that most people said, yeah, it's, it's a great idea, we need to work on some of the details. So we don't know if we want all, I don't remember the number of trails. We don't know if we want all, let's say there were seven trails, maybe we want five or maybe we want eight. Maybe we don't want them here, maybe we want them there. Um, one particular concern is the summit area. Uh, how close do we want the trails to the summit? Where exactly is the summit? Is it a point, is it an area? How big is that area? So there's some details that still need to be worked out. In the meantime, uh, the whole project was meant to be privately funded uh, the cost has now grown to about $500,000 was the last estimate. Uh, in order for those folks to put the $500,000 together, they're looking for some commitment from us that, yeah, this is something we really want to do because they would hate to raise uh, a bunch of money and get commitments for things, have everything come to us, and then have us say, well, geez, we're not really interested. So it's a little bit of a dance that we're doing because we, we don't have the, the management plan yet, but what I was going to propose is that we send a letter of support, and I can give you some details on what I propose to put in that, saying that, yes, as, as a council, we think it's generally a good idea. We'll defer to Conservation Commission on some of the details and where the trails would be laid out, um, but, you know, we'd like them to come back with a plan that would uh, allow the, some mountain bike trails to be constructed um, based on the, this sort of generous offer that, that's in front of us. So that, that's what I'm here to ask for tonight is your kind of consent that I can draft this letter uh, that we can send off so that they can go out and start to do the fundraising. 
we do have Margaret from the Conservation Commission who's been very patiently waiting for the entire meeting. Uh, and she's also the one who I think has been most involved with the environmental portion of the management plan. So she's available to answer any questions that you guys have before um, we move forward on this. Uh, I don't want to put her on the spot, but if you want to talk, you certainly can, Margaret. Um, so uh, do you want to bring Margaret over and then she can uh, talk if she chooses to? I do. Yep. Okay. We can. All right. So, Margaret, if you're there, you, you can speak. She just unmuted. So, and if you want a uh, full video, I don't like to surprise people who might be in their living rooms with full video, but if you'd like to be on video, <laughs> just go ahead and ask for it and I can make that happen. I am, I'm fine being off video, but thank you for the offer. Um, yeah, thanks. I just want to be on this call to just listen in. And as you said, Dan, if there are any questions, speak to those as best I can representing the Conservation Commission. I don't know how many folks are, are left in the crowd or maybe have uh, questions or comments. Not a lot. It's a dwindling crowd. There's three people in the room, and of course, we're all still here. Uh, <laughs> We've got four people online. So uh, one of the, when we had the, the public meeting, one of the key takeaways for me was, you know, ongoing costs and ongoing maintenance and who's going to be responsible and how we're going to fund that. Has that come up at all? Because while I think the idea is a positive one, I do still have those concerns. And before putting out an endorsement that leads people down the wrong path, I'd like to have some of those bases covered. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and it, it did come up in our, our sort of little summit meeting that we had. Um, and Jake, you may fill in if I don't remember everything correctly, but I, I, one of the, the key things I remembered is that if NEMBA is making this investment in their time and effort and their money and other people's money, uh, it's in their best interest to maintain the trails. Uh, so they do volunteer days. They, um, they say that they, they take care of the trails they've built in other communities. They have maybe 10 times the amount of trails they're proposing here in, in Gorham and about uh, the same amount in Falmouth or more. Um, so they're used to this. They do it a lot. If they don't get maintained, it's still our property. They're not, we're not granting them any property rights. Uh, we're not turning anything over to them. So if a trail doesn't get maintained, we can always say, well, sorry, I guess you can't mountain bike on that trail anymore because nobody's been around to maintain it. Um, so that's an option that we have. Um, we did talk briefly about trying to set up a, a trust uh, to cover maintenance, and that's an option as well, but that would be require raising even more money. Um, Jake, again, if I forgot anything, feel free to add. Yeah, no, I think that you, you hit the highlights. I, I was encouraged when they basically said, you know, just go and look at the properties that we've done because they, they're in good shape. And when they do the machine cut trails, those require less maintenance. So, you know, I think we've all heard, or a lot of the conversation revolves around Bradbury and the deterioration of those trails. Those weren't machine cuts, so they're rooted, they're ruddy. Um, you know, it's state run, whereas this would be, you know, maintained by them, they would be machine cut trails. So there would just be less maintenance needed. It's kind of like the um, stretch codes for the energy, right? Like you, you do the trail right in the first place and then it, it pays dividends long term. Yeah. And what the state trails, the, the state wasn't actively maintaining them at Bradbury. I think we did have some discussions too about would there be ancillary town costs about, um, I'm thinking out loud here, but uh, restrooms or parking, things that are kind of in that, yeah, things that are in that neighborhood that we would have to upgrade. I think that they were all kind of seen to be marginal, but we should probably identify those. Um, I don't think I'm going to come to you and say we need $100,000 a year to operate the trails, but it may be we need to increase this budget by a couple thousand dollars or something like that. I think before anything's approved, I think the major, kind of some of the major friction that, that, I took away and I wasn't there for the entire meeting, but um, that that most recent meeting, but have been for a lot of the ones in the past. We have options to do all these things. It's just they're not particularly, you know, easy. So like Hunter Road Fields has restrooms there, but there's a reason they're locked and not open seven days a week because of maybe trespass issues and they're not occupied and there's no one around. Mm -hmm. So kind of safety concerns, things like that. So there are options, but they're not easy options parking there's a ton of parking in that area you know could we keep people from parking at the trailhead that has six spots in it or four spots if you've got people who are park like 
jerks, you know, and take up seven spots at once, um, two spots maybe. Um, yeah, there's Pond Road Fields, there's Hunter Road Fields for parking. That would be a communication issue. The, you know, trash, do we want to have trash receptacle that's hauled? That would be a, you know, a marginal cost that we would absorb. So not free, but also I don't, I'm not seeing anything that makes me think you're going to take a massive budget hit to do this unless the town wants to. Yeah. I'm very supportive of the program, but there was a gentleman that uh, was at the public hearing we had for that, and I wish I could remember what organization it was, and he was very strongly recommending that we do have a trust, that we do have something established, and that's kind of what sold me, that uh, uh, we've all had uh, a lot of projects around these communities over the years that aren't going to cost us anything, and somehow... They bubble up, <laughs> so I'd like to see that, you know, as part of that. But I think it'd be a great addition to the community. Yeah, yeah, Margaret, do you, I see your hand up. Did you want to address that or something else? Yeah, I just wanted to um, to jump in and say that the the conservation commission also definitely heard those comments around the ongoing costs, and that's something that that we have been certainly chatting with NEMBA and with main trail builders about to try to establish kind of an annual estimate number of what potential costs could be thinking not only of trail maintenance, but also, as others said, the potential infrastructure costs. If, if one of the purposes is to really draw people to hedgehog, then making sure that parking and other, other issues that folks have pointed out are thought of ahead of time so that they're not issues down the road. And, and as was just said, um, Mason Morfitt from the Nature Conservancy formerly was a, a big proponent and came to a conservation commission meeting after the town forum and again very strongly advocated for having, having funds for this project in the long term, which I don't want to speak for the whole conservation commission, but I would certainly agree with um, since the since it is pretty much a, a volunteer effort. And if there's you know a quarter a half a million dollar price tag for just building the trails, you can be certain that there's going to be money down the road as well to to maintain them. Since weather changes, condition changes, the more use trails get, they're they're going to need some touch ups to stay in good shape. So that is a conversation that. The, Con the Conservation Commission and, and NEMBA and Maine Trail Builders are, are certainly having and exploring. And I'd say, folks, everyone's been very open to that conversation, but there li likely will be a role for the town to play since the Conservation Commission budget um, currently doesn't have the stretch for that, I would say. Yeah, not nearly. Yep. So let me uh, discuss the four things I was intending to put in a letter, and you guys can tell me if I'm on track here. So I would propose that we send a letter saying the council supports the project to build privately funded mountain bike trails at the town-owned Hedgehog Mountain property, one. Uh, second, that the property would still continue to be accessible for other uses, such as hiking, dog walking, wildlife observation, and we can add to that. Um, third is sort of the caveats, right? So the environmental impact is still being studied. We expect the Conservation Commission to come up with recommendations and a new management plan this winter that will include guidelines for mountain bike trails and uh, plans for ongoing maintenance. Not that the Conservation Commission needs to, to do the maintenance, but just kind of recommend what, what the maintenance should look like over time. Uh, and then lastly, that, that we endorse the project and look forward to approving it once the final plans have been worked out with NEMBA, the Conservation Commission, and the town. So it's an endorsement uh, saying that we anticipate approving it, but obviously we can't approve it now because there's nothing for us to approve yet. Did it uh, come up in the last meeting? Because I know there was also public comment around access for all abilities, and, and uh, I just don't know enough about that aspect of mountain biking to know how that's being planned or, like, what challenges there might be with that. Yeah, it did. And so the main trail builders is the company that NEMBA would contract with to build the trails, and they had somebody there at the meeting. And he offered to say, basically, we'll, we'll build whatever you want. And NEMBA was saying that there's probably a way we can build some accessible trails that wouldn't disrupt, interfere with, with the mountain bike trails they intend to build. But it was kind of that's more on us if we want to either fund it or find some sources to fund it. So while they're there doing the work, they'd be happy to also build a trail that's accessible 
whatever we decide that means, um, but that we probably need to come up with some, some extra funding for that if we want to do that. Council Bradley. Has there been any discussion of tort and tort immunity? Uh, tort immunity. Uh, it's extensive and it exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's town property. It's, it's, you, yeah, it's a, so, Ed, I think your specific concern is probably if it's something done by a private organization on the town land, what does the town lose the limitations that we would have if we did it ourselves? It's, it's actually a little different. I mean, I don't know what the, the tort exposure is, but, you know, you're not talking about, um, you know, municipal facilities or, or, or ordinary things. You're talking about running essentially like a, a ski area, you know, for bikes and um, people when maintenance comes up and you don't do it and roots appear and people get hurt or killed or paralyzed, uh, I don't know what our exposure is. I haven't looked at it, but I, I think it's uh, an issue that um, you ought to know the answer to it. If it's as simple as the initial comments suggested it would be, then that's great. And But if it isn't, then you might want to know that because that might increase the cost. My initial read is, and I would confirm this with the attorney, I, I'm not an attorney, I do not play one on TV even tonight, um, I would confirm that it's the same standard as uh, roads, streets, sidewalks, public facilities, which is ne there's a negligence standard. So if something is brought to your attention and nothing is done about it, for example, it's not posted, I believe the standard is within 24 hours or uh, or fixed. For, so if somebody says, hey, there's a giant hole in your sidewalk and 18 hours later someone falls in it and dies, we are exempt from that. If 20 five hours later someone falls in it and dies, that's considered negligence and usually that opens the door. That usually eliminates our immunity claim. Um, I'm assuming that it would fall under the same standard as those public other public facilities, but I'd want the town attorney to recommend that. It would be um, if, a, if a problem was pointed out that we did not correct in a set period of time a dangerous situation. Um, that's, that's generally how roads, streets, parks, things like that in Maine work. Um, uh, we would not be taking, we would not be selling tickets, so we would have no implied, you know, transactional standard like a ski area, municipal ski areas fall into that because you're providing a service. So there's an assumption that you're using all industrial standards in that industry to whatever they might be to prevent people from dying. But where it's just public space open, I think we'd have the kind of trails, parks standard. I would want to confirm that with the attorney. It's a very good question. We should obviously that's something before we sign and accept any money or do anything. We want to make sure we know the answer to. So, yeah. So based on the conversation tonight, I've, I've jotted down two notes that I'll add into the letter, which is one, um, you know, this is all pending sorting out funding for ongoing maintenance and then also pending legal review. Yep. And I've also let Tony and the others know that anything we sign and support is not binding. So we can't force a future council to say, well, you know, um, October 4th, we said we would approve it, so you have to approve it. They could change their minds down the road, but this is sort of reflective of, of where we are at this point in time in our intention. And Dan, I, I would say that, you know, I'm sure Tony and the group are looking for some positive response from us, and I would say that looking into all these issues is very positive. It's a, it's a good indication that we're serious about doing this or we wouldn't be asking these questions. That's certainly the spirit that I'm offering it and I, I saw Tony today, and I said, "Look, I support this thing. You don't have to worry about my vote, but I'd like to know we're doing it, doing it right." Yep, I'm yep. sure she feels the same way. Yep, and, and I think that that's the spirit where I'm coming at it from. It sounds like everyone is. Is we we all want to see it happen. We just want to exactly dot the i's and cross the t's, and we trust that that'll happen before it comes yep. up to us for approval <clears throat> or to the council. All right, so. I'm gathering that I've got some consent to go ahead and, and draft that letter and, and send it out. Uh, Mason, did you want to speak? Since you were referred to, uh, feel free to, to speak. You me before on this yeah, can the you make it up to the podium and, so and we speak? So we can catch you on, on the recording. What do you want me to do? Onto the, onto the podium. Oh, sorry. Uh, you've heard from me on this topic before. I worked for the Nature Conservancy for 35 years. We did a lot of land conservation. And one of the house rules was that you had to raise the endowment for the maintenance before you bought the property. And I think that stood us in very good stead. Over the years, we ended up acquiring 
a significant number of properties from other conservation groups that hadn't taken the precaution of endowing for stewardship and they couldn't handle them anymore and said, would, would, uh, would we take them over? So my concern would be that uh, uh, enthusiasm for the project probably is going to be quite high for the first few years. After that, who knows, volunteer uh, commitment tends to diminish over time. And uh, then all of a sudden you've got an expensive trail system that uh, uh, needs to be maintained. And I think once you develop an audience for it uh, or a constituency in the first few years, they're going to keep coming. Whether or not you've uh, canceled the lease uh, with NIMBA or not, they're going to keep coming. Uh, and the uh, destruction of the environment will just accelerate uh, and get worse over the years. So you already mentioned that this is subject, to, your approval is subject to working out the financing. I would just emphasize that aspect of it and encourage you to look into uh, ways you could either create an endowment or I don't know anything about bonding, but maybe bonding is another alternative that would uh, involve a uh, more modest upfront cost. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mason. That's helpful. So one thing that just popped in my mind, we haven't talked about this with NEMBA, with the Conservation Commission or anybody, is if that is a standard that we're going to uh, investigate at a minimum, the re probably my recommendation would be that we identify what those annual maintenance costs mm -hmm. are because yep. a viable alternative is, you know, we're not a nonprofit. We have taxation authority. Mm -hmm. We stick around. But we do need to identify and have the council vote mm -hmm. that, hey, we're accepting these long-term financial right. risks. At, at a minimum, say, hey, trail maintenance might be $50,000 a year in today's dollars and identify that beforehand. The council could vote to accept, but you need to know what right. the potential bag that the taxpayer holds in the future is. If you're not, if we're not going to endow if, the if property, endow it, right. right, then right. I think we should identify this is our projected annual bag 10 years mm -hmm. from now that we're going to leave somebody holding if NEMBA goes, you know, we have a sour relationship and they walk away and don't want to have anything to do with us. Either we have to restore the trails and make them impassable to, you know, right. woodland again, so mm -hmm. people won't be tempted to go and and go over them, or we need to be prepared to spend blank twenty twenty two dollars, whatever the year is in the future, adjusted for it, you know, annually. So, yep. I think the financial part covers it in the letter. Just kind of something that we, yeah, yeah, hadn't thought of long term. So, yep. Okay, I will definitely make sure that gets in there. All right. Oh, That's have, all I had on this matter. You have a hand in the audience. No, we do virtual audience from oh. Kara, who is here from our original. Okay. You want me to bring her? Awesome. Hi, Kara. Hello. As, as, as a mountain biker, I'm, I, oh, sorry, there's my dog. I did come to the first meeting and so uh, didn't even know it was on the agenda tonight. So glad to just have a chance to speak up. But um, I was, I guess I just say that it would be good to follow up with Gorham and see what their yep. situation is there and just get sort of a benchmark of another local town and how they deal with ongoing maintenance and, and Things like that. Yeah, we should probably program do anything that, yeah. Falmouth too. They, they've been very open about saying, yeah, I'm happy to, to put us in touch or happy to talk to them because they, they did a lot of work down there. That would be a good touch point. Um, I'd love to not have to drive as far to go mountain biking so I can use less uh, energy and have less of an impact on the climate. That's the idea. Bring more people to Freeport and have them recreate here. All right. Thank you, Kara. Um, that is all I had. Councilor Egan? Uh, make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Let's do a formal vote on that since we have two remote councilors. Councilor Pillsbury, what do you think? Aye. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Daniele? Yes. Councilor Bradley? Yes. Councilor Egan? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Mason, did you? Do you do you have a link, Mason? Were you beaming it to your ear? How did it work? Not very well.